Got a mic check. Looks good. All right, Caitlin, can you let me know if we're transmitting? Send me a message in Slack and let me know we're good. Okay. All right. How is everybody? Good. Good morning. Good morning. All right. Did you guys do your homework? Did you do the reading in um, the yellow book? And did you take the test on page 181 of the white book? Did you grade it? Awesome. You guys are all off to a great start. All right. When I call your name, if you can let me know either your grade if you use the grading scale or how many you miss. And I'll do the conversions for you. Kendra. No, um, I must have missed the whole part. Okay, no problem. That's fine. That's fine. Um, it's the grading, uh, the answer key is on page 201, the very last book or very last page in the book. So don't worry about it. That's fine. You can do it now. I'll come back to you. Uh, Brittany. I missed one. Sorry. Thank you. Lashadra. Thank you, Sahar. Thank you, Korea. Chelsea. Thank you, Catherine. Jordan. Thank you, Megan. Thank you, Tanaya. Thank you, Aliyah. Thank you, Ricky. Thank you, Lori. Thank you, Nadine. Jasmine. Thank you. And Jamie. Very good. All right. Did you guys have any questions on what you missed? Any questions? Anything when you missed it, you thought, oh, I don't know. Why did I miss that? You know, what, what does that mean? Any questions on that? Okay. Okay. I thought, I guess, I thought it would be harassment. Yep. So... Um, I guess I don't know what battery phone. Okay, that's actually a very, very common um, point of confusion. Okay, I gotta have some fresh air in here. <laughs> um, so, good morning. So, touching somebody without their permission is called battery. Okay. So this kind of gets a little confusing because we're talking about legal principles and they're not always uniform and different people or different states have different words for different things, right? But in general, battery is a physical act, okay? You're physically touching somebody. Neglect is an absence of an act. You didn't do something. Harassment is usually verbal you know, doing, saying something over and over and over again to get a reaction, basically, right? Unwanted attention that's persistent. That's um, the definition of harassment. What was the other one? Battery, neglect, neglect, abuse. abuse. Okay. Abuse can be any of those, right? So abuse is kind of an umbrella term. And abuse can be harassment. It, neglect is a form of abuse. Battery is abuse. Okay. Does that kind of help you make sense a little bit? You're not going to have a question like that on the state exam. They're not going to ask you what is battery. They're not going to ask you those types of things. I need you to know that because the whole root of touching somebody without their permission is actually a crime. Now, as CNAs, we kind of get a little sidetracked on this point, okay? Touching somebody without their permission is battery. It doesn't matter where it occurs. Come on in, good morning. It doesn't matter where it occurs. If I touch somebody without their permission at the movie theater, that's battery. If I touch somebody without their permission in this room, it's battery. If I touch somebody without their permission in a nursing home, it's still battery. 
patients have the right to refuse. We are there to help. But if the patient doesn't want the help, that's right. It is their choice. Absolutely. You can't force your care on someone else. Now, I know some of you are thinking, but what about dementia? Dementia patients don't, they, they have lost the ability to understand, right? It's a comprehension problem. So we're going to be doing mouth care. They don't understand why we're doing mouth care. They don't know what mouth care is anymore. They can't do it for themselves. But because they can't comprehend, they can't give consent. Does that make sense? Okay. So dementia cases are a little bit different because they can't really give consent. And there's a very tricky part of this, right? Because adults have rights. Have you ever heard that? I know my rights. Have you ever heard that statement? I know my rights. Well, people get a little sideways when it comes to rights, okay? You have rights and you have the right to stand up for your rights. You have the right to be free of abuse. If you're in an abusive relationship, you have the right to leave, right? We're not in, you know, the 1500s where where you got married, doesn't matter if you're being abused, you're going to stay, okay? So we have rights. We can choose. So yes, we, you know, rights are, are a big thing. The only people that can take your rights away, there's only three types of people that can take your rights away. Do you guys know that? There's only three types of people. And two of them are temporary. So a police officer can take your rights away by handcuffing you and putting you in jail. But that's temporary. You can only stay there for so long before you have to go see a judge. And the judge is the one that can make it longer, right? So judges have a lot of power, but there's a checks and balance system there because they allow you to plead your case, to hear your side of the story. And there's a jury involved usually, right? So judges have a lot of power, but there's a checks and balance system. Police officers have power, but it's limited and short term. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, doctors also have the power to restrict your rights, but it is just like cops, limited and short term. Who do you think has to be the one to make a longer term decision? Same, same system, the judge. So if we are going to take somebody's rights away from them, if they have dementia and we're going to take their rights away and say, no, you can't determine what's best for you anymore. That decision has to be made by a judge. judge. You guys see how that works? Did I say CNA anywhere in there? Did I say nurse anywhere in there? So we've got to be really, really careful as caregivers, that we aren't trampling on another person's right in the name of medicine. We don't have, we don't have the right to do that. Does that make sense? Okay. I have one more question. Sure. How is it neglect um, by not locking a wheelchair prior to transferring? Remember, neglect is an absence mm -hmm. of an action, mm -hmm. right? So when you see that word not, that's an absence of an action. So we did not lock the wheelchair. We should have. We did not lock the wheelchair. So we didn't do an action we needed to do. Absence of an action is neglect. Good? Makes sense? That's like if you have a child and you don't feed it, like ever. That's neglect. Right? Absence of an act. Now, neglect is a form of abuse, but it's absence of an action. You didn't feed them. So why is it um, important for the locking of the wheelchair then? So We're going to get to that okay. a little bit later in the program. I've got a whole okay. lecture on brakes on wheelchairs. Awesome. But the, the thing is, it's an absence of an action, okay. and that's what makes neglect. Thank you. You're welcome. Does anybody else have any questions on the reading or the homework? Anybody else? Okay. Kendra, how'd you do? Three? Okay. That's fine. Korea?
you have your scores for me? I do. I got them all right. Very good. Catherine? Thank you. And Nadine? Okay. Do you have uh, any questions that on the ones that you missed that I can help you with? No, you were able to go back and figure out where your, um, you know, where your confusion was. Good. All right. Very good. Okay. So, oh, congratulations, Leah. Past exams on Saturday. Congratulations. Welcome to healthcare. Okay, so we're going to do a review because we had a whole day in between classes and I need to make sure that you remembered what we went over in class on Monday. I went over a lot of information and I do it very quickly. So I want to make sure that you're, um, I'm going to move that camera, hold on, cutting off half my screen. I want to make sure that you guys are up to speed because we're going to build, there we go, a little bit more. We're going to build on what we learned, okay? So how do we know what to do? We're gonna go through this very quickly though. How do we know what to do with each patient? The care, the care plan, and we follow the care plan, the whole care plan, and? Nothing, nothing but the care plan. Now I'm gonna tell you, I know that I say this stuff a lot, and by the end of the, the you know course, you're gonna be rolling your eyes at me. When you go into test, and you are taking your test, either the skills or the written, you, everything that I say is very short, right? All the stuff I want you to remember, very short. You are going to hear my voice in your head because I say it so often. And you'll remember these important points when they become important during testing. And I hear it all the time from students. Oh my gosh, I heard you say that. So I do this for a reason because repetition does help with recall, okay? So we're going to follow the care plan, the whole care plan, and nothing but the care plan. Half of our job is to observe. observe. Yeah, and remember that's half of your job. If you're doing all the skills perfectly, but you're not observing for anything, you are not a good CNA. You might give the best bed bath in the world, but that does not make you a CNA. Make sense? Okay. Because you're only working at 50%. Everything we see, hear, smell, or feel, we're going to report to the nurse. nurse. Yep, nurse or RN, either one. Every skill starts with an opening. What does every opening start with? A knock. A knock. Okay. And we're going to greet the patient. Patient. Because remember, it's always about the patient. patient. And that's what we, that's why it's at the beginning of the opening. We have to, in our mind, right away, very first thing up front, patient. We're establishing, that's what the knock is about. That's what greeting them is about. It's always about the patient. How do we know if we have the right person? Address by, name. by name, correct, correct. What do they need to know about us? Our name and title, okay. And what are we going to be, we, we have to describe the skill. 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 Okay. Now you can describe the skill any way you want to. You can read it off the care plan. You can put it in your own words. Doesn't matter. You can say it any way you want to. They're not grading you on how you say it, but you do have to tell the patient what you're about to do with them. Because remember, patients have the right to refuse. So we have to get their permission. permission. That's right. Um, once we get all of that stuff done, we're going to close the curtain. Is that curtain clean? So what's the next thing you want to do? Yeah, don't you love my cooties? <laughs> You're going to see them a lot in this course. All of these graphics I actually create. I do graphic arts. So I create everything that you see in here. Um, and I had a lot of fun drawing cooties. <laughs> All right. And then once you have clean hands, you can go get your clean supplies. supplies. So any questions on the opening? All right. Moving on to the – whoops, sorry. Don't touch the patient until your hands are clean. clean. Okay, now we're going to move on to the closing. Um, we want to make sure the patient is in what kind of an environment when we leave? Clean, clean neat, tidy. Use your word, whatever you want. But, yeah, they will rest better if they're in a clean environment. I have a question about that. Yes. So, like, uh, 
Monday you said like if the garbage is full, if there's a, a, a meal tray, do we pick that up if we notice the stuff is full? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. And th I thank you. I want to actually talk about that for a second. Um, I've got a stray hair that's driving me nuts. Okay. So here's the thing. Okay. We have housekeeping mm -hmm. in the facility and we love housekeeping. They make our job so much better and so much easier. I absolutely love my housekeeping team, but that doesn't mean that they're the only people that are responsible for a clean environment. We are absolutely capable of bagging up trash and putting it in soiled utility. Now, I have actually worked in facilities where the CNAs thought that was beneath them. And I would walk into the room and there would be um, used adult briefs on the floor beside the trash can because trash can was full. And that is not the environment that your patient wants to be in. Okay. And their excuse was, well, housekeeping hasn't gotten to it yet. Right. Part of our job is to maintain a clean environment for our patients. We actually need to kind of look at it the other way. Housekeeping is there to help us not do all of the cleaning for us. Right. Make sense. Okay. Um, in fact, in some facilities, CNAs actually do the laundry. They throw the laundry in, they put it in the dryer and they, you know, in between patients, take it out and fold it. And that's perfectly okay because we are charged with maintaining a clean environment. Okay, good? Makes sense? Okay. Um, at the end of the skill, we're going to make sure the bed is in the lowest position. Now, we're going to talk a little bit more about this a little later on in the program. But when we leave the bed at the end of the skill, it's got to be in the lowest position. So what goes up must come yeah. down. Um, we have to ask them about comfort. comfort and they actually need to hear that word comfortable. You actually have to say that word. Are you comfortable? Now comfortable goes beyond just physical comfort. We're also going to ask them about their preferences, entertainment, you know, don't just leave them staring at a blank wall with nothing to do. They will be on the call light. I mean, they will, because that you are now their entertainment. <laughs> Absolutely. I've seen it a million times. You become their entertainment. So ask them, do you want the TV on, offer a magazine, something like that. For the test, we're just going to very simply cut everything out and just offer them a magazine. That's It's just easy, simple. Um, so just offer them a magazine. Um, we want to make sure the patient is covered, covered when we leave them. And uh, we're going, once we get all of that done or somewhere in there, we're going to open the, yeah, why can't we leave it closed for all patients all the time? Isolation. Isolation. That's right. Isolation leads to depression, which can lead to delay he healing. Okay. And then somewhere in there, we're also going to give them the call light. call light and instructions on how to use it. I usually throw in. Um, now, all of those things have to be done I don't care what order you do them in. The test does not care what order you do them in. The patient does not care what order you do them in. But I would suggest, those are, those are a lot of steps. I mean, look at all those steps there, right? I would suggest that you create a little blurb that you say at the end of every patient and memorize it and just say it that addresses all of that. Something like, thank you very much, Ms. Jones. Are you comfortable? Is there anything else I can get for you while I'm here? Here's your call light. If you need anything, press the red button. Your environment is clean. Your bed is in the low position and you're covered. I'm going to open your curtain and go wash my hands. It's a whole lot of words, isn't it? But if you start to practice that and make it part of your routine, when you get to the test, You'll go through it and you'll get all of those check marks. Remember, each one of these is a check mark on here in red. Look at all that red. If you don't get all of that done, you're not getting these check marks. Make sense? Good. Okay. 
All right. So once we've done all of that stuff and we got all the patient's cooties on our hands, what do you want to do with those cooties? Wash, wash them off. After you've washed those cooties off, then if we need to, we can chart. But if we're going to chart and we're touching that pen, what do you want to do again? Wash your, wash your hands because the standard is on the checklist, end skill with clean hands. So we can't touch the patient until we have clean hands and we have to end the skill with clean hands. Good? So this happens quite a bit, right? Because you're testing, you're nervous, you're going to forget steps. It's, it's going to happen. Going to happen. This happens quite a bit. People will do their uh, skill. They'll rush through the closing because they're trying to get it done and they just, you know, want out of the testing room. They'll rush through their closing. They'll go over, wash their hands, and then they'll realize that they didn't take the privacy blanket off or they didn't give the patient the call light or they didn't open the curtain. And they go back to the patient and they do whatever it is that they forgot to do. What do you have to do after that? Wash your hands again, because the standard is end skill with clean hands. So we're going to talk about that today. I'm going to teach you about privacy blankets, but that's unfortunately, it's the one thing that everybody forgets to do at the end of the skill. And usually when you're over at the sink washing your hands, you look over and you see it and you're like, oh, I got to take that off. So um, the point and we're going to get to privacy blanket in a minute. But the point of this is that if you wash your hands and you return to the patient, you got to wash your hands again. Okay, remember patient cooties. So they don't care if you forget something, if you go back and do it. And don't care. Yep. That, that you just have to make sure that you end the skill with clean hands. Okay. Yeah, they don't care. And you will forget stuff. You will. Because your, your brain's going to be a scrambled mess on testing day. And that's okay. Okay, so we have to end the skill with clean hands, but we also have to end the skill with a safe patient who feels cared about. And that's what a lot of the closing is designed to do. This is more important than you think it is. And let me explain to you why. How many of you guys are familiar with Medicare? Anybody familiar with Medicare? Okay. <laughs> Medicare is health insurance for the elderly. So once you reach a certain age, you're eligible for health insurance that's paid for by the government. Isn't it like 65 and up? Yep. Although my generation, they increased it to 68. Your generation, I think, is 72. Really? Oh, yeah. What? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you're paying in to get this benefit, but they're moving the benefit further away. And that's because we're living longer. When 65, when this went into effect, okay, and they set the age of 65, people were only living into their 70s. Right. That's not Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, they're, they're only getting it for a little while, and then they're probably going to die. Well, right. <laughs> as our ages are increasing, now we're living into the 80s and 90s. Right? We don't want to pay for your health care that whole time. So they're moving the age a little bit further out. So, okay. So this is a government funded insurance program, pays for health care. The majority of health care that's provided here in Florida is paid for by Medicare, the government. Now, they want to make sure the hospitals know this. Right. They, they have people that work there. It's their job to make sure that everything is is doing well for Medicare so that Medicare pays them. OK, because if Medicare does not like the way you provide care. They're not going to pay for it. Now, how do they know whether the patient got good care? So we'll talk about Martha. Martha is a 72-year-old, very active woman. She was out playing tennis, and she unfortunately fell and broke her hip. Ends up in our hospital. Surgeon does surgery. She has no complications. She progresses well. She gets discharged to a rehab center, okay? 
Now, once she is gone, Medicare is going to send her a survey. That's what it's called is a survey. And it's going to ask her, hey, Martha, how was the hospital stay? How was your care? Now, if Martha never got her call light answered, she hit the call light and it just beeped forever, never got her pain medications, physical therapy never came in to see her to get her started on therapy. They just did the surgery and shipped her off to a rehab, but they really didn't do anything else. She's going to write that on the survey. Medicare is going to come back to the facility and say, hey, you didn't provide the care that we contracted for. So therefore, we're not going to pay you the whole amount. Make sense? Okay. Good. This is going to impact your pay. Because if the facility isn't getting money for the care that it's providing, how are they going to pay you? So when you go to work at a facility, you're going to be going through an orientation. Part of that orientation is going to be centered around um, activities they want you to do to make sure your patient is cared about. One of the things that they're doing in healthcare facilities now, you know that call light system that they have? Patient hits call light, light goes off, right? It's actually timed how long from the time that call light goes off until it's turned off. It, that's actually timed. And if those times are beyond what they call the statistical average, then that facility gets cited. At the facility that I work at, we have this app called Atmos. It's like ATMOS. Yep. And um, if their call light hits 10 minutes, it goes to our um, nursing supervisor. Yeah. And then if it hits like, 20 minutes, then I mean, they change it every, but if it hits 20 minutes and it goes to our executive director, yeah, and they'll like try to call us in and be like, Hey, so what what was the reasoning that it was that took so long? It's really it's really weird. So let me explain to you why. Okay. Well, I understand why. Yeah, but let me give you a story. This happened right here in our community many years ago. Um there was a nursing home. A patient there, you know, patient, it's not in nursing homes are not like private rooms, right? You're always sharing a room with a roommate. So there was uh, two older men in this room and I don't remember what was happening with the guy in the first bed, but he couldn't get up. He couldn't get out of bed by himself. The guy in the second bed um, had some really serious liver issues and just some internal medicine issues. And he was, well, one of the things that he had was something called esophageal varices, which are varicose veins inside the esophagus. Your esophagus is a tube that when you eat, the food goes down through the esophagus to your tummy, right? That's how food gets digested. Well, varicose veins inside the esophagus, not a good thing. Um, this guy ate tortilla chips. Now, not a good idea. You're not supposed to have anything crunchy, sharp, nothing like that. It should be a soft, bland diet. Somehow, some way, he ended up eating chips, these hard tortilla chips. And on the way down, they cut open the um, varicose veins. So now this guy's got some blood going down into his tummy. And tummies don't like blood. They just don't. They usually eject it pretty quick. <laughs> So now this guy is throwing up blood. He hits the call light. Nobody comes. Nobody comes. He's still throwing up blood. And as he's throwing up, that's a very violent action. So what do you think happened to the rest of the uh, veins in his? Yeah, they kept bursting, right? So now we got lots and lots of blood being thrown up. And nobody's coming. Now, he can't yell for help because he's busy trying not to die. His roommate, of course, this now looks like a scene out of a horror movie, right? His roommate starts screaming, help, help, help. Nobody came. So who do you call when you need help? 
911. Absolutely. So <laughs> the roommate picks up his cell phone, calls 911. 911 responds to the facility. And the, it was like late at night, like 9, 10 o'clock at night. The facility doors are locked. So they're all banging on the doors. Let us in, let us in. Nurse goes out and she's like, what, what's going on? Why are you here? You have a medical emergency. Nurse says, no, I don't. I didn't call. I'm the one that would call. I didn't call. And they said, no, one of the patients called. So when call lights go off, yes, it could be my remote control dropped on the ground. Sure. It could be I want a glass of water. It could be I'm cold. Can I have a blanket? But it also could be a patient that's experienced a serious medical emergency. And that's why call lights are timed. Remember I told you on Monday, the very worst place to have a heart attack is in the hospital, hospital right? This is why, because in your day-to-day, -day, when you're just going through the routines, almost all your call lights are going to be my remote, glass of water, got to pee, need a blanket, right? They're all kind of mundane things. So you start to get a little jaded about call lights. You start to assume that every call light is going to be a, you know, time waster for you. But remember, those call lights are also there for emergencies. And if they don't get you, they will call 911. They will. Okay. Make sense? Yeah, you rather, you rather it be something falling on the floor than... Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. When I was a brand new nurse, I mean a baby nurse, I didn't know anything. Right? I'd graduated, but I had no life experience. I was working in a nursing home and we had a director of nursing change, right? So brand new director of nurses and she, nobody liked her. Her name was Cindy. I remember her vividly. Nobody liked her. She was tough. Well, she would go into a patient's room and she would hit the call light and she would wait and she would time. This is way before we had automated systems. Remember, I'm very old. Um, she would wait and she would time, but she did more than that. Anybody that she saw walk by the door and not check on that patient, she wrote down their name. And you got an invitation to come see her in her office at the end of the day. Oh, it's an excellent idea. Like I said, back then, nobody liked her, but man... She got that facility from a really bad rating, like nobody wanted to go there, up to a waiting list to get into the facility within a year. She got rid of all the bad staff, and she developed a staff that was willing to work together for the good of the patient. I loved her. It was a painful transition. But I absolutely loved her because it's much easier to work at a facility where everybody's working together and there's no fighting and backbiting um, than it is to work in a facility where everybody's just out for themselves, right? But the transition is painful. It is. Um, I'm going to say this from experience. Uh, we kind of need her in one of these facilities on 50 because my grandpa was in there and he had two broken hips and he had a roommate that was bouncing on his on his healing legs and no one no one came in with the help button nothing i was like this is what kind of made me push myself to be helping people oh my gosh we need better people no offense in those nursing homes because there's two nursing homes on 50 that nobody wants to go to and that's terrible yeah because sometimes insurance won't pay for like the higher end ones so. yeah we can do better yeah we can do better i just uh, you're hitting home so much because that's what happened to me last year this time um, my mother-in-law had a stroke and um, we had to put her in a home because it was a little, she was nonverbal, mm -hmm. which was really hard. So um, we put her in the home. She was there for two weeks. She ended up seizing all morning. Oh Nobody gosh. called us. We went to visit her other half in the other room said to us, she's been seizing all morning. Nobody ever called us. Oh they gosh. never had her taken to the hospital, nothing. 
when we got there, we called 911 to have her removed and taken to the hospital. Yeah. And she passed a week later. Oh my God. This is why certain people should so be. So it's like, that to me is bad. Yeah. Bad. We can do better. But doing better starts with training mm -hmm. and establishing expectations. And that's why I spend some time talking about this because training and, and expectations are important. Okay. So I've got a story for you this uh, yesterday. This is just yesterday. Um, so I'm plugged into all these CNA groups and there was one CNA and, and this really, you know, sometimes when we're working, we really can kind of get, um, focused on ourselves, right? It's natural. And that's why I spend a lot of time talking about, it's all about the patient, patient right? So this CNA typed into this forum, you know, basically was I wrong type thing. She had gone in to take vital signs on a patient and the oxygen saturation was 85%. Now, anything below 90 is dangerous. Okay. So it kind of gives you an idea. Oxygen was 85%. Now, what do we know about oxygen? Just basic. What, 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 you, need you need it. Yeah, absolutely. You need it. Kind of a important thing, right? So she goes to find the nurse and can't find the nurse. So she goes on and just does the rest of her stuff. And it's not until the end of the shift, right? She, she documented it, but it's not until the end of the shift when the nurse was going through all the vital signs that she noticed the patient had an oxygen of 85 hours ago. And the nurse said, you know, reamed her. Why didn't you tell me? This is a patient that needs medical attention and you didn't tell me. And the CNA says, well, I couldn't find you. And I forgot. And she couldn't understand why the nurse got mad at her. So lots of other CNAs chimed in and basically said that, you know, it's the nurse's responsibility to um, check the, the chart and, you know, monitor vital signs. And if it was that important, the nurse should have taken her own vital signs and all of this stuff trying to justify what happened with the CNA. Not a single comment. And there were over 60 comments, not a single comment, not a single one focused on the patient. Not a single one. That's a huge red flag. I don't know. Because she didn't, uh, you know, it, it's an anonymous thing. She didn't indicate what state. But not a single person was concerned about the patient. Just whether or not that CNA was right or wrong. Now, is that where my mom lay in there? I think I'd be a little more concerned. <laughs> right? So sometimes we can get very, very involved in our own lives, our own work uh, processes. You know, I, and I understand that, but try to take a second to take a step back once in a while and refocus on, wait a minute, how did this affect the patient and what could I do better next time to make sure that the patients don't have a negative impact? Does that make sense? I have no idea what happened to the patient. No idea because the post didn't tell me that. It was centered on the CNA and the nurse. But it's, it really is kind of important that we understand this going into it in training, right? Because when you get out there, you're going to forget a lot of what I say because you're going to get so busy in your day-to-day. -day. What if you can't find the nurse? Great question. Yeah, if, if I can't find my nurse, I will find a nurse. Okay. Any nurse will do. And if I can't find a nurse then I'm going to go to the assistant D-O-N. And if I can't find the assistant D-O-N, I'm going to go to the D-O-N, director of nurses. And if I can't find the D-O-N, we got a serious problem in this facility because there is not a single nurse that I can have contact with. And that is a red flag, right? So you should always, 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 always have a nurse available at least by phone. 
then just track someone down and not facilitate Yeah, I because I work at an air and when I sometimes I'm calling her and I can't get her, so my basically is just call nine one one and send out the resident. Okay. Is that your policy? Um yeah. I, well no, sometimes I I just do it just because of to be on the safe side because you can't get anyone to really get So every you. facility has a policy and procedure manual. How many guys have jobs? I love this. I love I usually get into this a little bit later in the program, right? So every job has a policy and procedure manual. Uh, some are better than others, certainly, right? Because policy and procedure manual is made up by people. But every job has a policy and procedure manual that tells you what to do if this should occur, right? So here at our register, we have a policy and procedure on how to ring up customers, right? But we also have, if you get stuck, this is the person that you're supposed to contact. So for the store, it's our manager and he works right next door, Jake. So if one of the employees has a problem, they go to the policy and procedure first. If the policy procedure doesn't give them the information they need, then they contact Jake, right? There, there's a defined uh, process they have to go through. Good, right? Now, if they can't get a hold of Jake, then I'm next on the list, right? So there's always a hierarchy. Now, in your job, wherever you work, and most of you have jobs or have had a job, right? Are you guys aware of your policy and procedure manual where you work? Everybody, do you know what that is? Do you know where to find it? I'll guarantee you that most of you have never opened it up and read it. Right? Guys, that policy and procedure manual is the only thing standing between you and the lawyer that wants to ream you. That's it. That is it. Your employer is not going to back you up that policy procedure manual is. So the reason I asked that, so your policy is if you can't get a hold of the nurse, you call 911 and send them out. Well, here's the problem with that. If that policy procedure manual does not tell you to do that, then that lawyer, because the family's going to sue you or you know, sue the facility, they will. That lawyer is going to ask you who gave you the authority to do that. That policy procedure manual is what's giving you the authority to do things, right? Mm -hmm. So wherever you go to work, you probably should spend some time looking at your policy and procedure manual because I can guarantee you that lawyer is going to know it front and back. You need to know what you're allowed to do and what you're not allowed to do. But one of the very first policies in every policy and procedure manual is your chain of command, right? You have a problem, you go to your nurse. If you can't get a hold of your nurse, you go to the shift supervisor. If you can't get a hold of that shift supervisor, you go to the ADON and then the DON and then the executive director, <laughs> right? You have a whole list and that's how they want you to proceed. So in your case, you work in an assisted living facility. Think of an assisted living facility. Uh, guys, an ALF is not a medical center. It's not. It is an apartment that's what an ALF is. It's an apartment that has laundry services, housekeeping, and dining. That's what an ALF is. Now, it also has people that can help you with ADLs, bathing, dressing, grooming, things like that if you need it, but you're going to pay extra for it, right? But those are ADLs. Those are non-medical. ADLs are kind of like, I, I look at it as helpful neighbors, right? Right? So you don't need a license to help somebody eat. You don't need a license to help somebody put their socks on. You don't need a license to make somebody's bed, right? Those are helpful neighbor type things. So ALFs are non-medical. So if there is a nurse on, on board, hey, that's great. That gives us somebody to call if we've got a question or a problem, but they're not required to because it's just an apartment with housekeeping and laundry and food. Make sense? That's why you don't have to be certified to work in an ALF. Okay. So your 
we don't expect too many medical situations to occur, but there still should be a policy and procedure in place when they do, especially falls. Oh my gosh, falls. There are a million falls um, and you need to know what to do in that. So for you guys that are getting ready to go to work, I would immediately ask an orientation, where's your policy and procedure manual? I'd like to have an hour with it, please. And I would look up four specific policies. Number one, falls. Falls. Number two, medical emergencies like heart attacks and strokes. What is my procedure? What do I do? Number three, clocking in, clocking out, pay, holiday pay. I want to know, you know, if I'm trading my hours for money, I want to know how that is going to work. And that policy and procedure is a contract with you, right? And number four, if I have a dispute, who do I contact? Right. So I would, if you don't do anything else, you need to know those four policies anywhere you work. If you work somewhere now, I would be looking those up. <laughs> I would be looking those up. Okay. But remember, it's all about the patient. Let's talk about hand sanitizer. Since we've talked about um, hand washing. So this is my little hand sanitizer guy. Any cute? Name is Jeremy. Okay, the problem with Jeremy is that he doesn't work on everything, okay? Hand sanitizer doesn't work on everything, and that's actually pretty important because there's two very specific things that it doesn't work on that could ruin your day. C. diff, which is an intestinal infection, and norovirus, which is also an intestinal infection. Norovirus is also called the daycare disease or the cruise ship disease. It'll make you sick for probably about two to three days. Comes out both ends, makes you feel like you want to die. It's absolutely horrible, but you get better after two or three days. Hand sanitizer does not kill it. If it gets into a facility, it will spread like wildfire, all the patients and the staff, because hand sanitizer does not kill it. You actually have to wash your hands before and after every patient contact, or you're going to spread it. And you'll take it home with you. Fun. Now, C. diff is an intestinal infection, usually results in the runs, and it lasts for six to eight weeks. And it is horrible. Horrible. Not uncommon to lose about 20 pounds with C. diff. It's horrible. And it absolutely is not killed by hand sanitizer. So when we're talking about hand sanitizer, we have to understand that while it is good, it's not great. Okay. The other problem with hand sanitizer is nobody uses it right. Most people, when they use hand sanitizer, they just get a little bit. And that's it. Right? That's not how you're supposed to use hand sanitizer. When you're using hand sanitizer, you need to get quite a bit and you have to rub your hands together so they're wet, wet, wet. And they have to stay wet for no less than 20 seconds. Where do we hear that? Hand washing. So if I'm using hand sanitizer and I have to use enough to keep my hands wet for no less than 20 seconds, I might as well just go to the sink, wash my hands. Because when I go to the sink and I wash my hands, where do those germs go? Down the, Down the drain. They're not on my hands anymore. If I use hand sanitizer, I've killed them. Great. Awesome. Wonderful. But where are the dead ones? Still on my hands. And when I go to eat my large fry, I'm eating it with a side of E. coli. Dead E. coli, yes, but still E. coli. Not very appetizing. I prefer ketchup. Okay, good. Questions? So we should not use hand sanitizer if our hands are going to go anywhere near our face, if we're going to eat, drink, smoke, talk on the phone. Um, we want to make sure that we have clean hands, pathogen-free hands, not just hand sanitized. 
If your hands are visibly soiled, if you got gunk on them, yuck on them, wash your hands. Hand sanitizer isn't going to remove the gunk. Okay. Good. Congratulations. You've just mastered three principles. So let's go on and learn a few more. So go to page 52 in your book. And we are going to learn our first skill. All right. So when you're looking at this page in your book, I'm going to point out a few things. So first thing that we want to look at is the name of the skill. This is how the test is going to uh, present this skill to you. This is what's going to be on your care plan. Along the side here, you can see the principles that are going to govern this skill. So we already know skill rules. So we're going to follow the care plan. We're going to start the skill with the opening. Every opening starts with a knock. A knock. We um, know the closing, right? Every closing, every skill ends the same way. And we're going to end the skill with clean hands. So we know these three. So that means that we still have to learn these two. And that's what we're going to concentrate on now. Down here at the bottom is test specific information. You should be able to take a pulse. Somebody with your level of experience should be able to do this within five minutes. We're only going to count for one. <laughs> so they give you lots of time here. This is going to be done on a live testing student. They'll be laying in bed. Charting is required. Our normal values are between 60 and 100. And you can be off by four beats in either direction. That means that if the evaluator got 76 and you got 72, 73, 74, 75, 76, 77, 78, 79, or 80, you're still within limits. It's a huge margin of error, guys. Huge. All right. So as we've talked about, we already knew, know skill rules, opening and closing. So let's learn glove rules. So it's going to take me a little bit of time because I've got to get you to unlearn a few things. And that's harder than learning. Okay. So it's going to be on page 40. And if you notice this right here, glove rules is featured in every single skill. It's one of our big four. And I do have a video on this that you can watch as well. So the big four are skill rules, opening, glove rules, and closing. You will see those in every single skill. Page 41 is going to answer the question we had on Monday. Do I need gloves for this? Right? Remember I told you we'll get to that today. Um, and it's not as easy as just wear gloves for everything. And a lot of people default to that. A lot of schools teach that, actually. Just wear gloves for everything. Don't worry about it. Don't think about it. If you're going to do a skill, just put some gloves on. But there's some problems with that. And that's what I want to lead you through right now. Okay? So in order to understand the problem with wearing gloves all the time without thinking about it, we're going to use a demonstration that has nothing to do with medicine because it illustrates this perfectly. So in order to explain this, we're going to build a sandwich. Okay. So when anybody ever go get a sandwich made? Yeah. So, you know, you tell them what you want. They build the sandwich right in front of you, right? That's what we're going to do together. So here we go. What kind of bread would you like? White bread. White. So... First thing I'm going to do is put on some gloves because I don't, you don't want me to touch that bread without gloves, right? With my bare hands. That's a little high on the gross meter, isn't it? How many of you guys feel comfortable with me wearing gloves when making your sandwich? Sure. Absolutely. So I'm going to go throw a set of gloves on and we can get started. So I'm going to go to the bread uh, rack and I'm going to pull that cover aside and get our loaf of white bread and I'm going to set it down on the counter. I'm going to pick up the knife that's there and I'm going to cut it in half and fold it open. But it's okay because I've got gloves on. I'm not touching your food with bare hands. 
So now that we've got our bread cut and opened, how about some mayo? Do we want mayo on there? So I'm going to reach over, grab that mayo spreader, right, that's hanging out in the mayo, and I'm going to spread it on the bread and put the mayo spreader back. Any other sauces, Chelsea? Chipotle. Chipotle. So I'm going to grab that little bottle there of Chipotle, pick it up, and squirt it on the sandwich as well. Okay, that looks good so far. I'm getting hungry. All right, how about some bacon? Let's get some bacon. So I'm gonna open the little refrigerator underneath. I'm gonna grab the um, package of bacon. We'll reach in and grab a couple slices out. And what kind of meat do you want? Ham, turkey, roast beef, ham? Okay, so I'm gonna open the cooler, reach in, get the, the ham out, close the cooler, and put the ham on the sandwich. So far, so good. Um, what kind of cheese do we want? American. American. So I'm going to open the cheese drawer, but oh no, I'm not American. So I'm going to go to the cooler and open the container that has the, the cheese in it. Hold on one second. Just hold on. Open the container that has the cheese and I'm going to take it over to the slicer and I'm going to slice some cheese and put that uh, big block of cheese back in the container and bring the cheese over to our sandwich. We want this toasted, obviously. So I'm gonna put it on the little paddle thing and we're gonna wait because the toaster's busy. And when it's our turn, we're going to open the toaster, slide the sandwich in, turn the dial and toast it. And then we're gonna pull it out. How about some toppings? So uh, did I do you? Okay, so do we want lettuce? So I'm going to reach my hand into the lettuce bin, shake it out, put it on the sandwich. How about some tomato? Yeah. So we're going to pick up the tomato. I'll cut that in half. So I'm going to pick up that knife, cut the tomato in half, and put it on the sandwich so it holds better later. How about some pickles? So I'm going to reach into the pickle thing and squeeze the pickle juice out and spread those on. How about some black olives? So I'm going to reach in, get some black olives. You want lettuce, or I'm sorry, um, green pepper or onion? No. Um, how about some uh, banana peppers, jalapenos? No. Okay. Uh, we got black olives. We're good. Uh, salt pepper. So I'm going to pick up the salt pe pepper shaker and put that on. How about oil vinegar? So I'll pick up the oil vinegar and sprinkle that on. Okay. And then I'm going to pick up that knife again and shove it into the sandwich as I close it. Right. And then I'm going to pull the knife out and cut the sandwich in half. Get sandwiches now. <laughs> well, hold on. Hold on. Yeah. And then we're going to wrap it up in the wrapper. We're going to go over and type it into the little uh, thing that gives us our price, right? Um, so you're ready to get your sandwich now. Do you still want to eat it? No. Why? No, wait a minute. Hold up. Hold up. You guys all just told me that you were happy I was wearing gloves making your sandwich, didn't you? <laughs> didn't you? Now, all of a sudden, you're not happy. Why? All those germs are all over that sandwich. Okay. Are you starting to think about gloves a little different? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> all right. So, did those gloves really do what you thought they were going to do? No. No. Hmm. They protect your hands. Okay, so here's the problem. When you start wearing gloves routinely, you stop paying attention to what you touch with those gloves. That's just a principle. So we've got to be a little smarter than this, right? Now, that sandwich was just fine. That was a real sandwich. I took those pictures. I ate that sandwich, and it was yummy. <laughs> because I've got a healthy, working immune system. And my immune system does need to work out now and again to stay healthy and in good shape. Nothing wrong with that sandwich. And there's nothing wrong with any other sandwiches. You guys can go have sandwiches. It's okay. That's not the point here. The point is that if we wear gloves routinely without thinking about it, we are doing to our patients what this person did to my sandwich. And your patient does not have the immune system that I do. And that's where the problem lies. So let's take a look real quick at all of the things that these gloves touch. And this is just a partial list, by the way. But we touch the outside of the bread cart, the knife, the mayonnaise spreader, the sauce bottles. Whoops. Oops, sorry. 
Um, the outside of the bacon package, the cheese drawer, the drawer handle, the containers inside the cooler, the slicing machine, the table, the toaster oven, the toaster oven controls, the paddle, the lettuce, tomato, and other toppings, the wrapper, all of that. Those gloves were not clean. That's a problem. So were the gloves really effective? Well, it really depends. It really does. Because if the gloves were there to keep the sandwich workers safe, they were pretty effective. Sandwich worker didn't touch a thing. But if the gloves were being worn to keep your sandwich safe, were they effective? No. So what was your question? I was just going to point out that they didn't move the gloves. That's it. Yep. Uh, I, I was a manager at McDonald's, and we actually had to start doing – a 10 minute timer because we, I would have to, I would notice a lot of my employees would wear their gloves through their whole shift and they wouldn't take them oh, off. They want to change no. them or anything. Oh, and oh like, yeah, McDonald's is busy. So like 30 minutes, you have about six, 16 to 50 sandwiches made done. And like, imagine how much is just done in 30 minutes, how much bacteria is on those gloves. I had to yell at so many people about their gloves because I'm just like, why haven't you changed them? I ended up putting a timer for every 10 minutes. I'm like, change y'all's gloves. I don't care. Change of gloves. Like, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, it was bad. It's, it's bad there. Just let go. <laughs> That's it. That, but it's very true because we stop paying attention. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So we have to think, all right. So in this scenario, who were those gloves supposed to be protecting? Uh, yeah. The customer, the sandwich, right. Oh. Right. Who did they end up protecting though? The worker. The worker is not in any danger from my sandwich. So it we kind of went at this a little bit back. Although you felt much better with them wearing gloves before this demonstration, didn't you? Yeah. Yeah. So now that we know what's happening with sandwiches, let's look at why this is not a good policy for healthcare. Okay. So healthcare workers work in environments with lots of pathogens. Remember, we talked about this on Monday. We make patients prove that they are sick enough to be in this place. And they bring all of their pathogens with them. So these settings are going to have a ton of pathogens. And when we wear gloves, part of what we are wearing gloves for is to protect the patient from the pathogens in the facility not just us, right? Remember that sandwich worker was not in any danger from my sandwich. So let's talk about the chain of infection to figure out whether we're in danger in a clinical facility. So if you go to page 123, we're gonna talk about the chain of infection. And this is the graphic in the middle of that page. So the chain of infection has very specific points to it. It has a pathogen, a reservoir, a portal of exit, mode of transition, transmission, portal of entry, and susceptible host. So we've got all of these parts to the chain of infection. And right now, looking at that graphic, it makes absolutely no sense to you when you're starting to glaze over and you really don't care. So let me make this a little bit more fun. Okay. We're going to go through each one of these stages and I'm going to explain to you what it means and why you should care. So the first stage is pathogen because no pathogen, no problem. You can't pass on something you don't have, right? So as long as there's no pathogen, there's nothing to worry about. But if we do have a pathogen, now our chain of infection begins. Now that pathogen doesn't live very well outside in the wide open spaces. Your pathogen actually needs a home to live in, okay? That home is called a host or a reservoir. Host if it's living, reservoir if it's not in most cases. Um, there's some semantics with that, but that, that kind of helps you, right? So where it lives. Good. The thing about it, though, the host is actually a home. 
How many of you guys are trying to break out of your home? Probably not. Home is <laughs> home, right? It's where you live. It's kind of comfy for you. You like it there. It's your space. You're not really trying to break out, are you? In fact, it's probably the one place you want to go when everything's going wrong in the world. Well, pathogens feel the same way about their home. They aren't trying to break out. Pathogens aren't drilling holes to get out of the host. In fact, in most cases, they kind of have to be forced out. They only leave through open doors, just like you and me. And a lot of times, it's under duress. Like we have to sneeze them out or cough them out or push them out somehow, right? They don't just like fly out by themselves. Pathogens come and go through open doors. Now, what does that mean for us? Well, open doors on a human are any natural body opening, like eyes, nose, mouth. Remember I said we sneeze them out or we cough them out? Genitals, rectal area, those are all open doors that pathogens can use to get out. Good. Another way of thinking about this is any wet body opening. But there's more. We also can have pathogens get out through wounds, rashes, sores, and incisions. Remember, open doors. Okay. So these are our wet body openings. So if we know that wet body openings are how pathogens leave a body, you probably don't want to touch any of those things unless you've got an extra layer of protection, right? Good. Remember, pathogens don't get out through the skin. They don't drill out. It's like having walls. You, I, I can't go through this wall into the next unit. I'd have to go out through the door and in through the other one, right? Pathogens also don't have feet. They can't walk anywhere. They don't have wings. They can't fly anywhere. They rely on something else to get them around. They either have to travel in fluid or on air particles or droplets in the air. They don't get around on their own. So think of it like they have to flow or float to get around. Good? Okay. This is their mode of transmission, how they travel. Not all pathogens travel the same way. COVID, which is out there, floats. Okay, it travels on droplets in your, you know, when you talk, when you laugh, when you cough, when you sneeze. It pushes out droplets and they travel on the droplets. So they float. Hepatitis does not float at all. You can't catch hepatitis by breathing somebody else's air. Hepatitis has to flow. Okay. So they're going to get around in blood and body fluids. So not all pathogens travel the same way. That's where infection control specialists come in because they learn about the pathogens and how they travel and tell you how to prevent infection. Good? If I had it to do all over again, I'd probably be an infection control specialist. So with the, uh, like the C. diff and everything, like, would they get quarantined at that? Like, would they be like, they are all in, included? They are in the isolation bubble? in most cases, but not a bubble. It's just a room by themselves. Okay. But that doesn't, unfortunately, yeah. because people don't wash their hands yeah. well, it doesn't keep it from spreading through the facility. But yeah, in most cases, we're going to put them in isolation. Okay. That's something called transmission-based precautions. We're going to talk about that a little later in the program. Okay. Okay. So how pathogens get around is their mode of transmission. And remember, it's usually in body fluids or air currents, but they're all going to be um, a little bit different in how they travel, okay? Um, but just getting out of a patient doesn't really help them because pathogens don't live well in the open. They need a nice, warm home. Like, I, I would not do well homeless. I would not. I just wouldn't. 
I like my creature comforts too much. Man, last night was cold. I would have just like curled up and died. <laughs> I would have given up. <laughs> Not for me. Sorry. Right. So pathogens are kind of the same way. They don't do well out in the open. They're looking for another host pretty quickly. In fact, most pathogens um, won't last more than a couple of hours outside of a body. Um, so pathogens can only enter a new host through an open door. Remember, it can't drill through your skin. They don't have that ability. So remember, in the body, a doorway is any wet body openings. Do you remember earlier today I said that if we're going to eat, drink, smoke, or talk on the phone, we should wash our hands, mm -hmm. not use hand sanitizer? That's because when you're going to do those things, your hand is up here around your face, and your face has lots of openings. yeah doorways, openings, holes. Good. The problem is that we tend to put our hands up around our face without even thinking about it. You, 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 <laughs> and you just had your hand up there too, and you don't even think about it. You don't realize that your hand is up there. And that's where hand washing really becomes very important, but also starting to pay attention to where your hands are at all times in a clinical setting. Your hands are like unruly two-year-olds. They will do things without your permission all the time. My, my hands, I'll tell you what my hands do without even thinking about it. Now, if I have soiled hands, what did I just put on my phone? Yeah. And it doesn't matter how many times I wash my hands when I touch that phone again. That's right. So be aware of what your hands are doing. Start paying attention. Okay. Remember that pathogens need an open door. If they can't find an open door to get in, they're going to die. They need an open door. They can't get through the skin. But if they can, if they find an open door and they get into the host, they're going to try to multiply like crazy as quick as possible. But don't panic because there's one more step here. You have to be susceptible. So let's say that we have COVID, known pathogen. COVID's living in a host. I'll pick on you, okay? So COVID is living inside of you and it's happy. Nothing is wrong, but your body coughs because your body... You guys know that a cough is your body trying to get rid of the pathogen? That's what it's doing. Yeah. COVID isn't making you cough. Your body is making you cough to get rid of that. Same thing with fever. Yeah. Fever is not caused by the pathogen. Fever is your body saying, hey, you don't belong. I'm going to make this a really horrible place for you. And maybe you'll go away. So it turns up the thermostat. Okay. <laughs> No, they like warm, but not hot. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. Because our body doesn't like being hot either. <laughs> yes. Right. We're going to talk about that cold environment in about 10 minutes. Okay. So yeah, warm, dark, and moist is the ideal breeding environment for pathogens. We're going to talk about that. That's why most facilities are a little bit on the colder side. So we have COVID inside you. Your body coughs to get rid of COVID. Now it's on droplets, right? So the portal of exit was her mouth. Good. Got it. That's how the pathogen got out. Motor transmission is it's going to float on those droplets. I come along within six to eight feet and I breathe those in. So now they're inside me through my nose and mouth. That was the portal of entry. Good. Okay. But it's still not, oh, it's not game over yet because there's one more step. I have to be susceptible. Susceptible means that I don't have an immune system that's able to fight that off before it is, has an effect, before it takes root. Good. Make sense? Now, how do I protect myself? Well, I would train my immune system. 
a way we train immune systems is two ways. There's only two ways to do it, really. One is um, natural immunity. I've caught COVID before. My body recognizes it, figures out how to get rid of it. So when it sees it again, it already knows how to take care of it, and it kills COVID before it ever takes root. That's natural immunity. Or I could take a shortcut, and I could get a vaccination that teaches my immune system what COVID is and how to get rid of it. So let me explain to you how this works, okay? So we have an open door there. Poor guys, you're about, you two are about to get clobbered. <laughs> All right, so we got an open door there. So we got a, uh, let's say that we have a robber all dressed in black who comes running in the door and tells you, give me all your money, okay? Now, you guys are all the white blood cells, okay? So the robber is trying to rob her. You guys are the defenders. So you're gonna try to figure out how to get rid of this guy pretty quick so he doesn't hurt her. So you are gonna pick up that Kleenex box and bash it over the head, okay? Yeah, well, that didn't really work, did it? No. So, yeah, so the Kleenex box didn't work. So you are going to kick him where the sun don't shine. And <laughs> now he's hobbling, but he's not really dead yet. So you're going to hit him over the head with that uh, glass bottle, but you're going to break it first, right? So we're doing more damage, but he's still not quite dead. So you are going to pick up a knife and stab him. <laughs> Congratulations. Now, we know that the knife worked, right? But what didn't work? Kleenex, kicking, glass bottle, right? So if we ever see another robber again, do we really want to go through all those steps? No. So you need to tell everybody in here what worked. So what worked? The knife. So now all of you guys know, right? You're spreading that information. All of you guys know that the next time you see a robber, go straight for the night, right? We're going to get rid of them. So the problem is that there was another guy right behind him. He had an accomplice and the accomplice saw you hit him with a Kleenex box, you kick him and you stab him with a glass bottle and none of that worked. But he knows that now the knife is coming. Okay. So he's prepared. That's right. So when he comes in the door, do you think that knife is going to work? No, because no, he's, he's got a shield. He already knows. Yeah, we've lost our element of surprise. Absolutely. So now we're going to have to start all over again and figure out what's going to work on this guy. How do we get around those defenses? Does that make sense? Okay. So that is called immunity. That's how immunity works. When you get invaded by a pathogen, your body has to go through a whole bunch of processes to figure out how to kill that pathogen. In the meantime, they're multiplying. When your body figures out what works, it spreads the word and you kill the infection and you get better. Now, the next time that same invader comes back, we have somebody at a filing cabinet that says, hold on, I've got that card. Looks it up, picks it out, says, oh, knife worked. <laughs> and spreads the word, and we can take care of that. Make sense? Good? That's what immunity is. Now, the problem is we aren't the only ones with immunity. Pathogens also have this same process. So when we throw an antibiotic at a pathogen, and we don't kill them all, we leave a couple, they now know our defenses. So the next time that we get that pathogen, that antibiotic isn't gonna work. This is why they tell you to take all of your antibiotics even after you start to feel better because you will start to feel better before all of them are dead and we don't want any survivors. Make sense? Good? So take all of your antibiotics because we, we're having a really serious problem with this now. We have a lot of antibiotic resistant bacteria and this is the process that's used, okay? 
Does that make sense? Everybody good with that? All right. So that took a lot of time, though. I mean, five minutes of our time <laughs> to talk about immunity. It would be a whole lot quicker if I just put a bulletin out. If you came in this morning and sat down and you had a piece of paper in front of you that said, use the knife. If an invader comes in, use a knife. Wouldn't that be helpful? Right? You don't have to go through the Kleenex box and kicking them in the glass bottle. You know, an invader comes in, you, yeah, use the knife. So that's what a vaccine does. That's all a vaccine does is it sends out a bulletin. Hey, if you see this guy, like a wanted poster, see this guy? This is what you do about it. So immunity can be natural. Your body goes through the process and figures it out. Or it can be um, artificial. Yeah, that's a good word. Where you're getting instructions and a wanted poster. Good? Makes sense? Okay. So if my immune system isn't susceptible, right? I've either seen that pathogen before and I know how to kill it, or I've got instructions on how to kill it, then I am not going to be infected. And the chain of infection stops there. But your immune system needs a little bit more than just information. It needs resources as well. So this is where getting enough rest, maintaining your stress level low, getting good exercise, you know, those things that everybody tells you to do that none of us can do in this, you know, current climate and economy, um, you know, keeping your immune system in good working order will help you as well. Okay. So that's all part of being susceptible. You want to make sure your self care, taking care of yourself and keeping your immune system up to date. Good. Questions? Having a healthy immune system allows your trained white blood cells, remember trained, to detect the invading pathogens and kill them. And if we have no pathogen, we have no problem, okay? Remember, pathogens need a home to survive, and most, most pathogens don't live very long on surfaces outside the body. And that includes clinical settings, clinical surfaces. Since pathogens usually travel in fluids, remember, they have to flow or float, as long as you're not touching body fluids, you're not really at risk. Does that make sense? Right? Skin to skin contact is not how most diseases are spread. In fact, very, very, very few can be spread by skin to skin contact. So I can reach out and touch your hand and I'm not at risk. I can do foot care on you and I'm not at risk because it's skin to skin contact, no body fluids. Make sense? So you guys understand a little bit more about how infections are spread now? Does it make a little more sense to you? All right, so even if you do touch body fluids, as long as those pathogens don't come into any of your doorways, you're not really in danger because remember they can't drill but your hands do things without your permission all the time. So you have to be careful about that. So an infection can only occur. They got to work hard at this guys. It's not easy. You got to have a pathogen. They have to have a place to live and multiply. They have to find a doorway out. They have to be able to travel in fluid or air currents. They have to find a doorway in and you have to be susceptible for an infection to spread. That's a whole lot of steps. It's not easy. We don't want to make it easier. Okay. We want them to have to work at this. So good rule of thumb here is don't let stuff from other people's holes into any of yours. Don't let stuff from other people's holes into any of yours. Yep, that is inside and outside of healthcare. Don't let stuff from <laughs> other people's holes into yours. It puts you at risk. Good? Make sense? 
That's how pathogens are going to spread. So if you're going to touch somebody's holes, we probably want to have an extra layer of protection. That's where gloves come in. Wearing gloves for everything with every patient isn't a good idea because we stop paying attention to what we're touching. Wearing gloves when it's indicated is a good idea because it provides an extra layer of protection from whatever is coming out of their body. But if we're wearing gloves, we have to be mindful of what we're touching, just like the sandwich maker. We don't want to touch the cheese drawer and the slicer and the toaster oven and all those other things and contaminate those gloves because remember, your patient is the one that's really at risk here. They have an immune system that's already busy, right? You're pretty healthy. Your immune system is just on standby, but your patient is not. Their immune system is currently fighting something off. And if their immune system is fighting something off in a setting with lots of other pathogens, and we don't pay attention to what our gloves are touching, and we bring more pathogens to the party, they're not going to have anybody to fight them off. Now, this sounds fine in theory, but let me give you some numbers to work with, okay? Right now in hospital settings, one out of every 25 patients has an infection that they did not come in with. And about 10% of those will die from it. Now, I don't know about you, but if I'm going in for a broken leg, I don't want any bonus pathogens. I don't want MRSA. I don't want C. diff. I don't want hepatitis. I don't want something that's going to put me at risk because my immune system is already busy. And I definitely don't want something that could absolutely kill me. How many guys ride roller coasters? Anybody ride roller coasters? Okay. Now, uh, roller coasters, you have about 24 seats. So if I told you as you're getting on the roller coaster, okay, have fun. This is a great ride. You're going to have a blast. But one of you guys is going to get mortally wounded. Have fun. How many guys are getting on that roller coaster? Yeah, I mean, you've only got a 1 in 24 chance, you know. Still get on, still take the chance, yeah, yeah. That's how patients feel about going to the hospital, though, because if they have something that needs medical care and they've had an experience where a loved one got sick at the hospital, that's the choice they have to make, right? Do I go get help knowing there's a risk? We have this in our control. This is all us. So if we can do our job well and get those numbers down, our patients will have more confidence in us. Good? Make sense? This is the big part I want you to remember. Patients or uh, pathogens can't drill. They can't drill into your skin. They have to have a doorway to get out. They have to have a doorway to get in. They don't go through the skin. So why is this particularly important for CNAs? Well, remember what we do, right? We do ADLs. We've heard that a couple of times. ADLs, bathing, dressing, grooming, toileting, feeding, socialization, all of those things. And that puts us in direct contact with all of your patients' holes. All of them. We get all of them. <laughs> So we've got to be super careful not to bring any pathogens to our patient's holes. Okay, good. So we want to make sure that our gloves stay clean for our patient. Those doorways can let pathogens out. Yeah, that does put you at risk. You're going to wear some gloves to help mitigate that risk. But we have to remember those same doorways are going to let pathogens in as well. So be careful what you're touching with those gloves that you're not cross-contaminating. Questions? 
All right, so gloves provide an extra layer of protection for the patient, too. They're supposed to keep us from introducing extra pathogens into the patient. So we're not going to... We're not going to wear gloves for everything, for every patient, because then we stop paying attention to this. Okay? we got some rules to learn. Anytime we might come into contact with body fluids, personal skin, or non-intact skin, we're going to use an extra layer of protection, gloves. But the way I want you to remember this, um, this is actually called standard precautions. All of you guys look pretty healthy in here. You're in a CNA class. You know, I'm looking at you. Nobody looks like they're on death's door. There's no way for me to know if any of you have hepatitis. It's a, it, there's a chance that somebody in this room may have hepatitis. You may not even know it yet. Okay? Because there's a period of time when you get infected that you don't have symptoms. Or you have symptoms, but you kind of ignore them and hope they go away. And it's not until they get bad enough that you go to the doctor and get some lab work done and get diagnosed. So that whole period of time, you are infected and able to transmit it, but you don't know that you have it. Nobody knows that you have it. There's no flashing neon sign in your forehead that says, caution, I have hepatitis. Okay, makes sense? So because you can't tell by looking at people, whether they're sick or not, whether they have a pathogen or not, we are going to wear gloves anytime we come into contact with anybody's body fluids. Anybody. If we come into contact with anybody's personal skin or non-intact skin, doesn't matter who they are. I'll give you a great example of this. My son, when he was 17 years old, went to work with my husband and dropped a metal frame on his leg and it went right down to the tendon. And his, uh, my husband called me and said, okay, what do I do? And I said, okay, go to Walgreens, get these supplies, bandage them up, bring them home to me, and I'll take a look. So my son gets home. He unwraps the bandage, and I go grab a pair of gloves. He's like, mom, why are you putting gloves on? And I said, you're 17, and you have been out of my sight for more than five minutes in your life, and I don't know what you've put where. Okay. I don't know if you have a pathogen. Now, I love my son with all of my heart. But I still don't know if he has a pathogen. Make sense? This is standard precautions. You use it with everybody. So if you're going to come into any contact with body fluids, personal skin, or non-intact skin, from anybody, you need an extra layer to protect not just you, but also them. Uh, do they grade you on wearing the gloves? They do, but they grade you on this. So if you're going to take a pulse and your patient's skin is intact and you try to grab a pair of gloves, they're going to tell you you don't need those. But if you're going to do mouth care, which puts us in contact with body fluids, right? and you don't wear gloves, you'll get marked off. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So you are graded on gloves, but you're graded on gl wearing gloves appropriately, not just for everything. Are we gonna do like PPE in this class or what? Um, you're gonna learn about it. It's not on the state exam. Donning and doffing PPE is not on the state exam, but we do have a lesson on it. Hold on, I'll give it to you. And it is something we're going to cover a little bit later in the class. But uh, PPE 124. But we'll get to that in a future lesson. So this is called standard precautions. It means we use it with everybody. Remember that pathogens travel in fluids or air currents. Um, remember that we want to add an extra layer of protection. If we have a patient, we're going to be touching body fluids, personal skin, or non-intact skin, we want gloves. So 
that's the first of our glove rules. The second glove rule, no. the second glove rule is that we wanna pay attention to what we touch with those gloves because they're not just there to protect us, who else are they supposed to be protecting? Patient. The patient. So when you put your gloves on, you don't wanna be touching a whole bunch of stuff. The way we remember this is the very first thing your gloves should touch is the patient that keeps your gloves clean for them. This is going to be hard for you guys because somebody in here on Monday asked, well, don't you put gloves on to get supplies? And the answer is no, because if I put gloves on and grab the supplies, what's the first thing my gloves are touching? Supplies. What is the first thing I'm supposed to be touching? Patient. That means that you're going to get all of your supplies and you're going to do all of your prep work and you're going to do everything you need to do to get ready to do the skill and then put the gloves on right before you touch the patient. This is going to be a little bit hard for some of you, especially if you're used to wearing gloves because you probably walk into a room, slap some gloves on and then do a whole bunch of stuff. So you may have to unlearn a few things. Make sense? Okay. Remember, doorways let things out and in. So once we have gloves on and we've touched our patient, we don't want to spread the love. We don't want to put those patient or those pathogens all over the patient's environment. So you got to pay attention to what your dirty gloves have touched. Okay. Um, Try to minimize cross-contamination. And then we have to remove our soiled gloves correctly. So let me show you this. Okay, take two gloves and pass the box. So as we're spreading these gloves around, everybody take a set of gloves. If you're allergic to latex, please don't take those. Grab one of the green ones over there. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about gloves because they're not the magic suit of armor you think they are. A lot of people think I put gloves on and I'm safe. I put gloves on and my patient's safe. And that's not the case. Gloves are not the magic suit of armor you think they are. And I'm going to prove it to you. Gloves are made of latex, just like this balloon, right? Fill a balloon up with helium, it's going to bop up against the ceiling for hours, maybe even days. But it doesn't stay inflated. It eventually starts to deflate like this. Everybody with me? Everybody see this? Huh? Not yet. Everybody familiar with this? How does this happen? Anybody know? Okay, helium does escape over time and you're on the right track, but let me tell you a little bit more specifically how it happens. Latex is a man-made material and it has holes, microscopic holes in it. As you inflate the balloon with helium, the fabric stretches and what happens to those holes? Yeah, they expand. So over time, helium is able to wiggle its way out through the holes. So as the helium escapes, the balloon gets a little bit smaller. And then eventually, we get to a point where we have this little sad excuse of a balloon, right? Now the, the fabric is um, tight enough, the weave is tight enough that the helium can't escape. Good? Make sense? All right. So this tells us two things. Three, really. Um, our gloves have holes, same material, gloves have holes. If helium can get through, you think pathogens are going to have any problem? No. So it's not giving you the protection you think it is. It's blocking out some, but not all. Good. Makes sense. Okay. But it's affected by time, right? Because the helium didn't escape right away. And it's affected by stretch. So you want to make sure that you're wearing gloves that fit appropriately and you're not stretching the material so much that those holes are becoming so big. So what you were saying feeds into this perfectly, right? 
because time is going to play a factor here. If you put gloves on, do your skill, get those gloves off, the pathogens really didn't have a whole lot of time to wiggle out, wiggle through. Make sense? But if you put those gloves on and leave them on for long periods of time, now those pathogens have the time it needs to wiggle through the fabric. Good? Make sense? Anybody ever wear gloves? What does it make your hands do? Sweat. Sweat. That is correct. Now, that's a problem because the inside of that glove is the ideal breeding environment for pathogens. Warm, body heat. Dark, because the glove is opaque. And moist, because of sweat. Warm, dark, moist. Ideal breeding environment for pathogens. We talked a little bit about that on Monday. Quickly, because hand washing was rushed. Warm, dark, moist. You ever gone to like a big box store where they have the cat? They don't have cashiers anymore. Uh, they have self checkouts. But have you ever seen those cashiers that wear gloves as they're checking you out? Everybody see that? So this always cracks me up, right? Because they think they're doing. A, they don't want to touch your ketchup bottle. They don't know what pathogens are on it. So they think they're doing themselves a favor. They put some gloves on. They work a four hour shift. They scan everything. But underneath those gloves, they're sweaty, and they're wearing them for like four hours before they have a break. So time, stretch, sweat, ideal breeding environment. And then after their four hours, they're ready to go on break. They take their gloves off and they go eat their tuna salad sandwich with a side of E. coli because they think those gloves kept them clean and they didn't go wash their hands. They're actually in way more uh, danger than if they had worn no gloves at all and washed their hands before they ate. See how gloves, a little bit of knowledge can actually put us in a lot more danger. Good. Okay. So if the pathogens got through your glove and onto your hand and multiply, what do you think you want to do? Wash, wash them. We've got to wash our hands after we remove gloves. That way, any pathogens that did get on them, we're going to wash away. Now, you don't have to wash your hands like right away. Remember though, the patient's cooties. When we remove our gloves, we can still finish up with the patient and wash our hands at the end. But if you wanna wash them right away, you can, no problem. All right, so put your gloves on and I'm gonna show you how to remove them properly because we have to remove our gloves the right way. Otherwise, they're not effective at all. Okay. I forgot to uh, bring the shaving cream. I usually have shaving cream that um, I make you put your hands in. That way you can tell if you've cross-contaminated. But let's pretend that your hands are dirty, okay? We we put our gloves on, we've done our scale, we have soiled gloves on, and now we have to take them off. Well, the trick is we don't wanna cross-contaminate. We don't wanna put these pathogens that are on my gloves on my skin. So in order to take gloves off, we're going to follow these four steps. The first thing we're going to do is pinch up here. Do not go underneath because glove can touch glove. Glove cannot touch skin. So we're going to pinch up here and pull it off inside out. And then we're going to roll it up in that hand so it's not waving around, flinging pathogens everywhere. Now, skin can touch skin. That's not a problem, but I cannot touch this glove. So do not do this. You see how that would be wrong? We want to go underneath and pull that glove off. So one glove is inside the other glove inside out. I always have a question. I'm sorry. No, it's fine. But like, like you said, like sometimes pathogens can get through the gloves, so you're touching your hand to your skin. That'd be superfluous. Right? Well, we're going to be washing our hands. And remember that you want to wash your wrists okay. as part of your hands. So now you guys all have gloves you can go home and clean your toilets with. All right. So to review our glove rules, we're going to use gloves when we might touch body fluids, personal skin, or non-intact skin. 
The first thing our gloves should touch is the patient. We're going to uh, pay attention to what, we're, what other things we're touching in the environment. So we're not gonna cross contaminate and we're gonna remove our gloves correctly. So we now know the, the big four. We know the skill rules, the opening, glove rules, and the closing. And we're gonna use all four of those in every skill we learn from this point forward. Good? Good. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and take a break, come back at 11, and uh, we will go over pulse. So 127. Okay, that day, yep. Um, yes, it is uh, this Saturday and then on week four, Monday afternoon.
Hey, we're back. I won't be able to Oh, yeah. Can one of you guys get that for me? You can just put the little doorstop in the handle. It just kind of lives there. All right. That's fine. Thanks. All right. Any questions before we move on? Any questions? No? Yeah, my knee. All right, let's go to page 52. Let me go back here. All right, let's take a look at this real quick. We know skill rules, right? We follow the care plan. We know how to do the opening. Now we know to evaluate if we need gloves. We know the closing. So all that's left to learn for this particular skill are the skill specific steps. And that's what we're gonna concentrate on now. At the bottom here, you can see our um, test specific information that we went over earlier. And there is a video for this too that you can watch if you'd like. So the first thing that we have to figure out is what is a pulse? I mean, what does this even mean? What are we doing here? Most of us are familiar with the term, but you may not know what it actually is. And a pulse is nothing more than the measurement of how many times your heart has beat over a minute. Now we're doing it down here. And that's because when your heart contracts, right, we have a heart here it squeezes. When it squeezes, it pushes out a wave of blood. That wave pushes the one in front of it. That wave pushes the one in front of it. And that wave pushes the one in front of it. And that's how blood moves through your circulatory system. So you, if I were to cut a hole right here and we looked into my artery, you would see a wave go through and then a valley and then a wave go through in a valley and a wave go through in a valley and a wave go through. And that's what we're going to do is count the amount of waves. And we do that by feel. We push down on an artery with two fingers, never your thumb. You never take a pulse with your thumb. It has its own artery. And because you're compressing it, you can get your own pulse. That won't help you. <laughs> so two fingers, you're going to press down on the artery. And when you press down, you can actually feel these waves move under your finger as a thump. Okay, makes sense? Good. So all we're going to do is count that we're going to find the pulse and count those thumps. If we count for one full minute, that gives us our pulse reading. Good. Questions? Did you say you had times it by four? We're going to get there. Yep, we're going to get there. So when we depress the artery, we want to depress it enough that we can feel those thumps. But you don't want to press it so much that we close off the artery because then we're not going to feel any thumps. So this is a little bit tricky, okay? You got to press hard enough that you can feel it, but not so hard that you kill it. So we're going to start light. If we don't feel anything, we're going to press a little bit harder. If we don't feel anything, press a little harder until we pick that thump up. Good? Make sense? Remember, if you press too hard, you're going to squeeze it off like a straw and you won't feel anything. When we're taking a pulse, if you just set your fingers there, you'll probably feel it. I mean, most people do, but you'll lose it because a minute is a very long. You're about to find out just how long a minute is. A minute is a very long time. So when you're taking the pulse, um, and you find the pulse with your fingers and you put it on and you gradually increase your pressure until you pick it up. 
over a minute, your fingers are going to relax. You won't have any control over it. It just happens. It's unconscious and you'll lose the count. So by putting your thumb on the back side of the wrist while you're counting holds consistent pressure. It puts your hand in a C shape. So now you're holding consistent pressure and you're less likely to lose that thump as you're counting. Hi. Hi. How, good. How are you? Good. Very good. Happy Very good. Thank you. Happy New Year to you too. You. Have a great day. Previous student. <laughs> All right, so where is the pulse located? Well, we have lots and lots of different pulse points on our body. We have carotid, which is here under the chin. We have radial, which is the one we're going to use here at the wrist. We have a brachial here at the elbow that we're gonna use for blood pressure next week. We have axillary, which is in the underarm region that we use on babies. We have femoral, which is in the groin. We have popliteal, which is behind the knee, and we have dorsal pedalis, which is on the top of the foot. So lots of different pulse points in the body. Now, as CNAs, we generally stick with three. We do radial at the wrist for regular, brachial at the elbow for blood pressure, brachial blood pressure, those two go together, radial wrist, they sound alike. And then we do carotid when we think our patient is dead. For CPR. So carotid for CPR. Okay, good. So radial wrist sounds alike. Brachial blood pressure starts with B. Carotid CPR starts with C. Good. <clears throat> Questions? Make sure the elbow is always supported. You don't want your patient's arm hanging out here in midair. This takes a lot of effort for the muscles because the muscles are expending a lot of energy they're gonna need more blood. Since they need more blood, it's gonna speed up the pulse. And now we're not gonna get an accurate reading. So make sure that elbow is supported somewhere, table, bed, chair, somewhere, okay? So how long do we count? Well, short answer is? Care plan, care plan. <laughs> absolutely, care plan. So this care plan, if we read it, it says patient will be lying in bed for skill. Take the patient's radial pulse, and it even tells you where, measured at the wrist, for one full minute and record our reading. So for this skill, how long are we going to count for? One full minute. We're going to follow that care plan. But if care plan doesn't specify, then we're not going to count for a whole minute. It's a whole lot of time. we got a lot of things to do. You know, if our patient's pulse is regular and steady and nothing really going on, we're just kind of doing a spot check. We're going to pull, uh, count for 15 seconds, okay? But we still need to report it over a minute. All pulses are always over a minute. Whether we're counting for a full minute or 15 seconds, doesn't matter. We have to report it over a minute. So if I counted for 15 seconds, how many 15-second segments are in a minute? Four. So if I count for 15 seconds and then multiply that by four, I get my full minute. Make sense? Good. Did I lose anybody there? Okay. So this is a whole minute, right? Whole minute. All pulses are always recorded over a full minute. So if I count for a full minute, I'm just going to use that number because I'm reporting it over a full minute. I'm counting for a full minute. But if I don't have to count for, if my care plan didn't tell me to count for a full minute, then I can shortcut this and just count it for 15 seconds and multiply that by four. And that gives me my full minute. It's just a shortcut. Can't use it on everybody, but when we can, it really saves us some time. Now, I'm gonna tell you that not all places are gonna have you taking an actual pulse, a manual pulse. We have these things now. These are called pulse oxes. And these, if you put it on the patient's finger and press the on button and just give it a second, it's gonna give you my pulse. We'll also give you my oxygen reading. 
What do we know about anything under 90? Bad. Bad. Who do we tell? Nurse. Do we wait till the end of the shift? No. no. <laughs> okay. So if you look at this, my pulse rate is 84. See the bottom number there? 84. What's my oxygen? That's because I'm talking a lot. Okay. Good. When taking a pulse, don't you want them to stay quiet? You do. Yeah. And so I'm not a good candidate for this right now because I'm standing <laughs> up and talking. <laughs> okay. But it shows you how the pulse, this is way quicker than standing there for a whole minute and counting, you know, especially if you have a mind that wanders. Right. And when I'm counting for a full, you guys are about to see how long a minute is. When I'm counting for a full minute, about halfway through, my stomach's going, I'm hungry. And my mind is going, what's for lunch? <laughs> right? But I'm supposed to be counting. So it's really easy to lose count. That's why this is helpful. Um, I imagine at some point, eventually, they won't have pulse on the state exam anymore because most places are using this. They're cheap. They go into your pocket. They're easy to use. So when you do get into the facility, you can just buy one of those instead of doing those. We're going to go by our facility policy and procedure. Sure. Okay. So the if the policy says yes, they'll probably have them right there. The, the facilities usually will have them. You have to know how, because what if the batteries are dead in that? Yeah. What if the batteries are dead? Can we just throw our hands up and go, oh, we can't take the pulse today. No. So we have to know how to do this manually. That's with everything in medicine. We may be able to rely on some tools to help us with workflow and time management, but it doesn't erase our obligation to know how to do it manually in case those tools are broken or unavailable or out of service. That's why we're going to learn how to take an actual blood pressure next week, because we can't rely on the automated cuffs. What if they're not available or they're broken. We have to know how to do these things manually. Make sense? Is the Good. manual one the one that... Um... You pump up. Okay. Yep. Yep. All right. So here is on page 53, our step-by-step -step instructions. Remember our peanut butter and jelly? Right? So we have the care plan at the top of the page. It tells you step-by-step -step exactly how to do this. It shows you the documentation form. Your supplies are listed at the bottom. And then we've got some questions here just to make sure that you got the um, information that you needed. Speaking of, the um, review sheets that I gave you guys after class, were they helpful for you yes. to kind of sum up everything that we went over? Those, um, I would encourage you to do those after each class and to save them. And that's what you should take with you to the test so that when you're studying before your test, you know, when other people are testing, you got that time to study, that's what you should be looking over because it's a really good review of everything that we covered. And just by reading it, it'll bring back to mind what we went over in class. Okay. I've got some for you today that they stopped printing. So I'm hoping I'm not out of ink. So we'll see. <laughs> They're also on our uh, courses website. Those of you at home, those of you tuning in from home, I got 20. Um, hey, if you guys are finding this helpful, give me a thumbs up on YouTube because YouTube needs to know that you like this. But those of you at home, if you go to courses.4yourcna.com, Caitlin, put that up for me, please. Courses.4yourcna.com and lesson one, it's unlocked. Everybody can access it. The um, review sheets are there. You can print them out yourself. So those sh review sheets are available to everybody. There you go. Thank you, Caitlin. Let's give a round of applause to Caitlin. She is incredible. I am super, super happy to have her on our team to help me with this. So take a bow, Caitlin. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So normal pulse rate, normal values are between 60 and 100. That's what we're hoping for, between 60 and 100. You can see that at the bottom. Whoops. You can see that on page 52, you can see at the bottom there, 60 to 100 is normal. What would we do if we got 52? Report it to the nurse. What would we do if we got 112? Report it to the nurse. Yeah. Sooner rather than later, right? You don't want to, like, put this off forever. But it's not just abnormals we want to report to the nurse. What if we got... 62, OK? 
Okay, 60 to 100 is normal. So is 62 normal? Yes. Yeah. All right, so we got 62. We're happy with that. But we go to chart it. And in the patient's chart, this patient's pulse, all the ones that you see before, are 98, 110, 104, 96. And we got 62. Okay, why? It's normal. It's between 60 and 100. It's normal, but why should we report it? That's right. It's not normal for the patient. So normal we, is actually defined in two ways. There's normal values, but then there's also normal for the patient. If either one of those is off, you need to report it. Okay. What if you're finding out the 60 is the more normal than the other ones? The other ones were not as normal, even though it was coming. Not your job to interpret. Okay. So if you know, so that's an observation, right? So we noticed that this pulse rate is different than those. So we don't interpret, we don't decide, we don't think. <laughs> Yeah, it's up to the nurse. We just report it. And they may say, oh, yeah, they're on a new medication. It's fine. I don't need you to report anything unless it goes under 60. Hey, cool. Now we got some new things on the care plan. Now we know what to report. But we need to still pass it on until we're told otherwise. Okay. Good. Questions? All right, I'm going to show you how to take a pulse. So here are our test specific instructions. These are things that we need to make sure that we're doing in order to get all of our check marks on the state exam. We wanna support the arm. We've already talked about that, right? We don't wanna use our thumb to take the pulse. We've already talked about that. We're gonna use our fingertips, not the flat areas of the fingers. And let me explain why. Your fingertips have way more nerve endings than this part of your finger. Your fingertips are much more sensitive. So if I take my fingers and I just lay them there, I might pick up the pulse, but it's not going to be as easy to count as if I use my fingertips. So if I put my fingertips on like this, it's way more sensitive. This is different than this. You guys see that? This or this? This is going to be more sensitive. Good? Questions? So I do have a question for the sake again. If it takes you a second to find the it's fine. Pulse, that's fine. Okay. Fine. You can take all the time you need. We're going to talk about skills timing a little bit later in the program. I know. I keep saying that, right? But I can't give you, I, if I tried to give you all the information at once, it would be a 24 hour class and that you would drown. Um, so we're going to talk about skills timing a little bit later, but you do have the time that you need to be able to find the pulse. So where is the pulse? Well, we know it's at the wrist. The care plan told us it was at the wrist. We know about where it is, but we need to get a little more specific. The pulse itself, what we're trying to find, the radial pulse, is at the top of the thumb side of the wrist. So here's your thumb. It's up here at the top of the thumb side of your wrist not down here, it's way up here. So there's a bone that runs right along the top of your wrist. Can everybody find your bone? Okay, put your hand out like you're gonna shake somebody's hand. Find your bone. And if you take two fingers and you stand up on that bone like you're gonna dive off a cliff, and then you just roll forward and put your thumb on the back, you will be right over your face. Remember, you wanna use your fingertips, not the flat areas. Fingertips. Did everybody find their pulse? Mm -hmm. Is anybody dead? No. Are you dead? Ah, oh, I like dead people. Okay. So we're going to go way up here at the bendy part of your wrist. There's your bone. Roll forward. Put your thumb on the back. Oh, not dead. Got it? Did you get it? Did you get it? Did you get it? Sure. We usually use the carotid when we think somebody is dead because it's a big artery. And if they're, if they're truly dead, we're not going to feel anything, right? It's, it's the easiest artery 
to feel something with. I'll tell you why we don't use it for uh, C CNA in just a minute, though. If you think about your question, let me know. Did you find it? Did you find it? Did you find it? Did you find it? No? You're dead? All right. Okay. So we're going to go way up here. Use your fingertips. Kind of bend your fingers like that. Thumb on the back. For some reason, no, because my is I found it. And then after she actually told us. Find it? Let me see. I don't think you're pressing hard enough. Let me see. Okay. Yours is actually right here. You feel how hard I'm pressing. That's how hard you want to press. Yours is right there. It's a little bit lower. Got it. Good. 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 Yeah, it's, it's not in the middle. So if you come up a little bit further towards your thumb, way, way up here. Fingertips, so then there we go. <laughs> Got it? So come a little bit higher. Come up here. There you go. Oh, you, were you better? Okay. Yeah, I think so. Got it? Okay, good. All right. All right. So everybody good? You got it? All right, let me explain to you why, as I see it, these are way bigger arteries, right? You can really feel this. Why don't we use that as a CNA? They're bigger. They're easier to feel. Let me show you why. I'm going to pick on you. Sorry. Okay, let's say I'm going to take her pulse, okay? As a CNA, I come in and I say, hi, Ms. Jones. My name is Patty. I'm your CNA today. Um, I need to get your pulse. Is that okay? Close curtain, wash hands. I'm ready to go, right? Oh. <laughs> How comfortable are you? No, not really. No, no. <laughs> And that anxiety is going to make her heart rate go up. Am I getting an accurate reading? No. No, that's why we don't use the carotid. Okay. Make sense? That makes sense. I was telling you sometimes that there's like, sometimes you get like a, like a, I think she called it like a backbeat or like. Okay. No, not, wait, wait, no. Like, um. Like a reverb from the pulse going on. Okay. Yeah. So what we're feeling are waves. No, I know what you're talking about. And I know what she's talking about. It's an uh, it's an irregular beat. Okay. So this is when we have an irregular heart rate, this is when we would count for one full minute. Okay. So if we have something irregular, and, and there's something called AFib, atrial fibrillation, that causes a very irregular rhythm. And an AFib heart rate is going to be like this. It's just super yeah. irregular. Very irregular. It's Very random. irregular. I mean, it's just random. And you can have like long pauses and you're like, uh, okay, there it is. <laughs> <laughs> you know? So um, with that, we can't count for 15 seconds and multiply that by four because it's just so irregular. Right, there's no pattern to it. So with AFib, we always count for one full minute, and that's why our care plan would tell us one full minute. Now, there is something else, and I'll get to you in just a second. There is something else that you need to be aware of, and this is going to happen primarily in uh, children, in older adults, and very, very tiny people, okay? And this is when... The heart rate speeds up and slows down, but it's a very regular pattern. It just speeds up and it slows down and it speeds up and it slows down and it speeds up and it slows down. It's a very regular pattern, but it's, it's an irregular beat. Make sense? Let me explain what's happening. Inside the chest, okay, in my chest, I have a heart that's squeezing blood and I have lungs that are inflating and deflating. Now, this whole area is ribbed by bone. I've got ribs, I've got a breastbone, I've got a spine. Not a lot of room to move. Got it? Okay, so there's not, everything's kind of caged in. That's why we call it a rib cage. Okay, so when we inhale, our lungs expand. Well, there's no room for it to go, so it ends up pushing on the heart. Okay, and the heart goes, whoa, and it speeds up 
And as we exhale and the lungs relax, the heart is able to spread out again and it goes, ah, right? So with little people, that doesn't have a lot of space for their heart and lungs to really move, you're going to see this speed up, slow down, speed up, slow down. But it's a regular pattern. Does that make sense? And some of you guys are going to feel that in here in just a few minutes because there's some people in here that that's probably going to affect. But that is not really irregular. That's a space problem, not a heart problem. Um, so like oh. when you go to the doctor and they, they check your heartbeat and everything, they ask you to breathe heavy and like breathe in, breathe out. They're listening to your lungs, oh. not your heart. Yeah. They listen to your heart. But then when they ask you to breathe, they're listening to your lungs. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. This has nothing to do with anxiety. I didn't think about it. But like I have nails. I see other girls have nails. Are we allowed to have them? For the Facility day? policy where you work. Right. So wherever you work, they're going to define what they allow and don't allow for the test. They don't care. The test. They don't care. More, more professional to okay. you can have paint like mine, you know, right. This, these are gels. They're not acrylics, but they're gels. You can have painted nails. You can have them a little bit longer. Um, this is perfectly OK. But if I were working in a clinical setting, I would not have my nails this long. And the reason for that is because stuff is going to get underneath my nails. Now I'm going to go home and I'm actually going to cook for my family with these same hands. So if I'm working at a clinical setting with real patients, I am not going to have nails this long and they're not going to be polished because polish is going to hold pathogens. Okay. I also have another question. You're an RN. Mm -hmm. So <sighs> okay. my question is like, you don't really, I don't know when, when older people like get, I don't know what the words are when they go and they get tested and they figure out what's wrong with them and everything. It's not you, right? It's like the doctors that are doing it. Like if they're going to get like an MRI or something, you have nothing to do with that. Right. So there's two different types of, of medicine, which is what you're referring to. Okay. There's diagnostic medicine and that's done by the doctors, okay. physician assistants, nurse practitioners, healthcare providers. They're worried about what's wrong with you. Okay. But while they're working on whatever's wrong with you, either diagnostic testing or treatment or whatever, right? They're focused on the, the, the problem, right? You're going to be in a facility where somebody's got to pay attention to whether you're eating because they don't care. The, the, they don't care if you go to the bathroom. They, they don't care. That's a, they're there for the problem, right? So we got to have somebody who's focused on the other stuff. Like, the stuff that keeps you alive, that's nursing. Okay, so is it common for, like, doctors and the people that diagnose stuff to, like, mess up and, like, oh, you have this, and then two days later you don't have that? Well, it's why we call it practicing medicine. Okay. okay. Because it's, you know, we don't have crystal balls. <laughs> we have to guess. We can make an educated guess. We can look at the tests. We can look at your symptoms. We can look at how you respond to treatment, but there's nothing, you don't have like a LCD screen on your forehead that says, this is what's wrong with me. If you did, man, our jobs would be way easier, <laughs> but we have to guess. They're educated guesses. That's what they go to school for is to figure out, you know, what it's most likely to be. Okay. So it's an educated guess, but it is still a guess. So for when someone has a stroke, they yep. say that it affects the right side of the body or is it one or the other? Like Stroke is a problem in the brain. Yeah. It's an interruption of blood flow to a part of the brain. Now the brain's a big organ, right? Mm -hmm. It's got lots of little neighborhoods in there and they all do something different, right? So think about New York, right? There's, there's lots of different places in New York. There's the Bronx, there's the Island, there's Manhattan, right? Lots of different places and they all have their own little flavor. Right. But your brain is like that. It's got lots of little neighborhoods. So when blood flow is interrupted to a part of the brain, it's going to have symptoms based on what that part of the brain does. OK, so if you have a stroke in the vision center of your brain, you may lose vision. 
If you have a stroke in the motor center of your brain, you may lose physical function on one side, depending on which side of the brain is affected. The brain works the opposite side of the body. So this side of my brain works this side of my body. Yeah, that's, I'll never understand that. That's okay. That's all right. But um, the effect of a stroke is going to be related to the area of the brain that went without blood flow. Okay. Now, since we're on the stroke subject, um, so my father, he passed away unexpectedly from a stroke. I'm sorry. Thank you. Um, but the doctors, they told me that he had signed, like he had, he was having stroke, a stroke for days and we, we didn't even know about it. We couldn't tell or anything. How, if, if a situation like that occurs, how would you be able to tell? Like, is there, is there any signs like early stage signs that you would be able to? We're getting into specifics that? now. And that's very difficult for me to interject just because okay. everybody is different. Right. 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 Okay. So your dad may have been having signs of um, an interruption of blood flow and it may have affected his speech. It may have affected his vision. It he may was, have affected his coordination. He was super tired like all the time. Okay. He could never, he could never stay awake for more than like four hours. And okay. That was like the biggest sign. And then he would lose his train of thought. But other than that, it was, we just thought he was sleep deprived. But, yeah. And in that case, you didn't do anything right. There wasn't really anything, yeah, yeah. you know, to, to that would have made you rush him to the ER. Right, right. Right. Not everything that's life threatening gives you the clues that you're looking for. Okay. Unfortunately. Yeah. You know, I mean, there are some people that literally get up out of their recliner, stand up and drop dead from a heart attack. Right now, they may have been a little short of breath. Before that, they may have, you know, tired out easily. You know, it, it was just, you know, yeah, their heart was affected, but it really didn't give off any big check engine light. <laughs> yeah, he kind of just, like, he wasn't, he, he wanted to go to the bathroom. He, he was a truck driver, so he just, like, he got out on his truck, and then he just collapsed. And then just always, that's where everything started. Yeah, and you may have somebody that's having a stroke that has, um, difficulty speaking, you know, and, and they go to the emergency room because the signs are so visible yeah. that they get treatment, yeah. right? So it depends on the signs. That's why as CNAs, we have to report everything we observe because right. we, if somebody had said, hey, this patient is tired all the time, he's not staying awake for more than four hours, that may be a clue to the, to the nurse that we need to do some tests and see what's going on, okay. right? So even something that simple, like th this person can't stay awake for more than four hours and that's unusual for them, mm -hmm. that prompts us to take another step gotcha. or another look. Okay. Okay. okay? One more thing and then I won't talk for like 30 minutes. You're fine. <laughs> um, my grandma, she, we, okay. we were going on vacation and I went to go eat breakfast with her and I noticed she was like closed with her you know, Talking like that. Yeah, so I told my mother, and then grandma said she was fine, whatever, whatever. So we went on our vacation because she didn't want us to stay home, whatever. She ended up, um, her friend went to her house to watch her while we were gone, and her friend went to go in the bath. I'm sorry. Oh, yes. not left, but yes, okay. All right, I talk a little slow. Um, her friend found her in the bathroom, stumped over, and she called the cops. I mean, she called 911. And she was septic, I guess. And she went to the hospital. They tested her. They said she had a stroke. And then they came back two days later and said that she had no stroke. And it was like a weird process. I don't know. Maybe it was because she was 85 years old. And like her body was just shutting down. And everything was just crashing. And they didn't know what to tell us. Because we were like going that crazy, you know. Um, but she ended up dying. And there was no cause from it. Well, septis, se yeah. septicemia, which is a bacterial infection of the blood, uh -huh. can be fatal, and it will affect every organ. But when it starts, the first symptoms that you see are very similar to a stroke. Oh, okay. 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 Mm -hmm. They can be, yeah. She was in the hospital for a month and a half. Until so, but they had to do tests and figure out that at, at first they probably suspected a stroke because of the symptoms. But once the tests come back and it confirms that no, there wasn't a stroke, 
this is what's going on. That's where they change their diagnosis because they're getting more information. Right. So let me let me kind of give you an example that might make a little bit more sense to you. Right. So you have that cup in front of you. Right. OK. By looking at that cup from here, I can imagine it probably has a liquid in it. Right. So that's a pretty safe assumption, isn't it? OK. Um, now, I can assume that it's water based on the fact that you're pregnant but that doesn't mean it couldn't be vodka. Right, how, how would I know? I stand up in two seconds. Okay, so I would look <laughs> at symptoms. Yeah, that symptoms would help. But what if you were a chronic vodka drinker and that you accommodated very well? How could I really know whether that was water or vodka? Test it, yeah. Yeah, I'd have to test it to know. But just by looking at it, I can make some assumptions and they're pretty safe assumptions, right? But I wouldn't know for sure until I had the opportunity to run some tests. That's medicine. Okay. Now I can assume it's water just because I know you're pregnant. And water is a good thing for you to drink. But I can't be sure, can I? I did my math. I've been living 186 ounces. It's a lot of water. <laughs> it's a lot of water. <laughs> yeah. Do you have a question? Um, is it true, like, people who are about to have a stroke have like, I remember my professor told me they can have like an aura or something like that. Some do, not all. It depends on what part of the brain is being affected. Can you also be like asymptomatic? Or like sure. Absolutely. Depending on the part of the brain being affected. Yeah. So if you suspect somebody is having a stroke, there's four things. Okay. Um, you want to look for facial drooping. That's a very common sign. And like slurred speech. Slurred speech. So we ask them to speak a simple sentence. You have them hold their arms out like they're holding a pizza box and make sure that they're equal and that you don't have one that's drifting, right? So it's F-A-S-T, okay? So facial expression, facial drooping, arms, okay? We're looking for palm or drift. Um, S is speech, so we ask them to speak a simple sentence. And T is time, how long since they were last normal? So those are the, the four things that you want to look at if you suspect somebody's having a stroke. I'm so sorry about the question. But, um, so I, I had a resident at my facility. She's passed now. But she was presenting all the symptoms. One eye, like, drooping. She We had her smile at us. She had one side of her mouth down, arms drooping, everything. We go and we tell our charge nurse, and she charts it but does not go and look at the resident. We said it like four times and she doesn't go. And the next thing you know, the next day she's passed away from a massive stroke. Yeah. So that's happened to me like three times where I'm at. Oh, is what else can I like do? We'll go to school higher maybe next time. Oh, okay. They're not taking it serious. Oh, we do. <laughs> is there anything extra that we can like do besides, because it's like past a certain point. Report it to HR. Report it. After all that. After all <laughs> that. <laughs> after all that. <laughs> So I can't give specific <laughs> guidance because these are not my patients. It's well, yeah, not my facility, right? So I have to be very, very careful, and I'm broadcasting to the world. So keep this in mind. It's okay. You have not violated any HIPAA rules. I've been paying attention. So here is the safe thing that I am going to say. Follow your chain of command, Okay. Report to your nurse, report to the DON, or ADON, and then your DON, whatever your chain of command is. If you have concerns that your facility is not caring for the patients properly, there is an abuse hotline. You can contact the Agency for Healthcare Administration in Florida, AHCA, and uh, you can report it. Okay, so AHCA, Agency for Healthcare Administration, just type in AHCA Florida, it'll come up. Um, patient hotline, it'll come up, um, you know, and, and that, those are, that is the agency that oversees the quality of care. Okay. So that is who you would report it to if you suspect neglect, abuse, um, improper medical care, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. But I can't give you specifics. I can't say that they did anything wrong in this situation because 
I wasn't there. And I don't want to pass judgment without having all of the information. Because there may be details there that I'm just not privy to. No, no, that, that's okay. It's okay. It just kind of puts me on the spot because I have to be careful um, because I, I don't want to throw a nurse under the bus saying, you know, oh, that's horrible. They did the wrong thing because I don't know. Maybe they did look at him and you weren't aware of it. Or maybe the patient was a DNR and you didn't know about it. You know, I mean, there, there's a lot of possibilities over it that I just don't have access to. Does that make sense? All right, so let's get back to Pulse. Hey, everyone. I'm new here having my CNA finals exam on Saturdays. Any tips? Yes, we're going to follow the? Airplane. Airplane. There you go. That'll pass the test. Follow that care plan. Exactly. All right. Oh, no, let's go back here. Okay. So I am going to move you guys around a little bit, and we are going to take a Pulse, okay? And um, we're going to have one. I'm going to work with you. So, so you're not going to be, I'll work with you. All right. So what I want you to do, uh, everybody stand up. It says we're all going to move. We're going to play musical chairs here. So I need you to bring your chair around here, please. Okay. You're going to turn your chair around and face them see here you're going to turn your chair around and face them and i'm actually going to have you come over here you are going to be right here so you two can have a seat so all of you guys can have a seat in the chairs that you're in facing the direction i told you okay so i need you to turn your chair around so it's facing back there but you're going to come up here with me <laughs> okay and then actually in the middle Oh, I do have enough. Oh, no, I do have one. Okay. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. One, two, three. Oh, I do have enough. All right. So you're going to face them. Sorry. Sorry. Um, I need your chair over here. So let me have that chair real quick. Yeah, turn yours. Chelsea, turn yours around. I need groups of three. So this is. I, I'm trying to figure out how to make this work. Okay. So, Chelsea, you come sit here. I need you to come sit here. And you guys sit down. So, I've got groups of three. There's, you've got, this is a big class. I'm trying to figure all this out. What's that? Oh, we, oh, we do have an extra. I knew we did. I knew we did. Okay. So, um, Chelsea, come with me. And I need you to go sit where Ch Chelsea is. Okay. All right. So Chelsea, just have a seat on that bed for me. All right. So remember the role that I give you. All right. Remember the role. CNA, evaluator, patient. 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 All right, everybody good? You know your role. All right, you are going, patience, patience. You are going to put both of your arms out on the table, palm up, supported by the table. The CNA is going to find the pulse on the hand closest to them, and the evaluator is going to find the pulse on the other hand closest to them. So you're going to find a pulse here and you're gonna find a pulse here. Now, you can either use an overhand grip or an underhand grip, doesn't matter, but find the pulse on the hand closest to you. Use your dominant hand. So put your hand here, find there. I was gonna say, mine's like right there. When you have the pulse, when you find the pulse, I need you to say yes. 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 So you want to do an overhand grip. So it's going to be right here. And thumb on the back. There you go. Got it? Got it? Got it? Okay, you're going to take mine. 
So, yep, right there. And let me know when you have it. Okay, I'm going to do the timing. I can't feel her pulse for real. She Very <laughs> awesome. All right, I'm going to do the timing here, guys. I'm going to say start in just a second. You are going to count the thumps that you feel under your finger until I say stop. If you lose the count, just sit quietly and don't say anything so you don't throw everybody else off. Got it? Yes. I'm going to do the timing for you. So count from the time I say start until I say stop. That's just a little bit harder. All right, ready? Everybody ready? Yes. Set. Start. What'd you get? Okay, what'd you get? I got What'd you get? Good job, guys. Good job. Great pulse. Uh, first, and I was just like, a whale. Okay. What'd you guys get? Okay. Okay. All right. When you were the patient, let me talk to the patients for a second. How long was that minute? Long time, long time. So when you are counting the pulse and you have to count for one full minute, if your patient feels like it's taking a long time, they're gonna start talking to you because they're nervous. What do you think that's gonna do to your uh, counting? So you need to let them know, hey, I need to take your pulse. It's gonna take me about a minute. I'll need you to remain quiet, but I'll let you know as soon as I'm done. That keeps them from talking and it does work. Okay, so we're going to, everybody's staying where you are, but the person that was the CNA is now the patient. Okay, so put your arms out and we're going to do it again and you can just rest. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. No, nope, just put your arms out. That's why I've got you guys on the table the way I've got you. Because you can reach. Okay, so you should you should have his other hand. So evaluator, you are still the evaluator. Evaluators are still the evaluators. So make sure you find your pulse. Evaluators find the pulse. Put your thumb on the back. And that way you have. Um, See if you can find it. All right. Does everybody have the pulse? Does anybody not have the pulse? Okay. 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 Having trouble? Okay. Feel how hard I'm Sometimes, right? And then is she pressing as hard as I do? Got it? Okay. You still having trouble? Okay. So you can actually do an overhand grip. Just rest your hand. You can do an overhand grip. I don't know. I feel like you should be like, close your hands, your hands, for sure. You should just close your hands. Close your eyes. Because that, that increases the sensitivity of your finger. You got it? Okay. Everybody ready?
Press a little bit harder. I don't think you're pressing yeah. quite hard enough. Got it? Okay. Here we go. Let me know when you got it. All right, ready, set, start. I got 82. Very good. Oh. What'd you guys get? Okay, that's close. That's close. That's close. So you lost it? Okay. How'd you guys do? Huh? Uh, probably not. <laughs> And then it felt like it went faster. And then it tasted. Yeah. She is she's in the seventies. So it's okay. She's all right. But Starting out fast, I'll explain why and why it slowed after. I'll explain why in just a second. How'd you guys do? I got 72. I got 65. Okay. So remember that if we're in four beats of our evaluator's reading, we're accurate. So some of us um, maybe lost count or counted. Remember that your brain can absolutely drift on this, especially when you're counting. But why? I know that with her, her heart rate started out fast and then started to slow. Well, because when I say start, she knows her pulse is being counted. What do you think that does to her, her oh, anxiety? Exactly. Yeah, and then as we're counting, she's starting to calm down. And what does that do to the heart rate? Slows it, Slows it down. So that's not uncommon. And you may actually get that with your patients as well because they know they're being judged, right? When I did the first round you did, I did hers. And it was starting off slow and then faster. Why did that change? It's I was insane. holding it in my lap. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that could be, <laughs> that could be, um, and, and plus she's pregnant. So that's going to affect the pulse rate a little bit as well. So the evaluators are now the patients and then the, the other two, yeah, are, are going to be checking the pulse. So go ahead and grab your patients and you can just rest. <laughs> Okay. So, are you right-handed? Left. You're left-handed. Yep. Right -handed. You can you can do you can do over, or you can do under. <laughs> yeah. So you can do an overhand grip, or if you're on this side, you can do an underhand. All right. Does everybody have the pulse? Okay. Like I got sure. Okay. I'm nervous. Got it? Got it? Got it? You guys? Okay. I'll be a city I'll be a city girl. Yeah, hers is down a little bit more. Hers is like right in here. Yeah, you get me? Got it? Hey, you guys good? You guys good? 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 
Good. All right. Here we go. Here we go. Start. Hey, are you guys pretty close in the ballpark? I lost her after like 20 seconds. I'm like, fuck. All right, go ahead and pull your chairs back to their normal seats and have a seat. Because I'm up and moving. Yeah, and remember 60 to 100 is normal, so I'm right in the middle of normal. Yeah, I'm right in the middle of normal. Under 60 is true. Yeah. Anything over 100 or under 60. All right. So let's talk about the test. So I'm going to show you the video for this so you can see how it looks. Now that you've taken a pulse, you can see how it looks. For the, the test, we have two evaluators. You're going to have to count with both. You're going to be on one side of the patient. One of the evaluators will be on the other side of the patient, just like we set it up in here for practice. After you do that reading, the second evaluator will ask you to count with them. You don't have to do your closing and all of that. They'll let you write that number down. And then you'll count with the second evaluator. Then you'll do your closing. Okay. It's just because both of them have to be able to evaluate you independently. So you're going to count with both. That means you're going to count twice. Good? Make sense? Okay. Your patient for this skill is lying in bed, just like this one. So you get to pick which arm you want to use. All up to you. But there is some, you want to practice this. You want to practice this with a patient in a bed because you will be more comfortable on one side of the bed or the other, just because of the way that you have, have to hold the arm. So you're gonna have to figure out which side of the bed you wanna be on. And you wanna do that before you get to the testing subject. Okay, good. Questions? All right, let me show you this skill. Hello. Hi, Mr. Jones. My name is Patty. I'm your CNA today. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Wonderful. I need to get your vital signs. Is that okay? Yes. I'm going to close your curtain, wash my hands, and I'll be right back. Okay. Okay, Mr. Mm -hmm. Jones. This will take me about a minute. I'll need you to remain quiet during that time, but I'll let you know as soon as I'm done, okay? Okay. Okay. Ready? Start.
stop. Thank you very much, no, Mr. Jones. Is there anything else no. I can get for you while I'm here? No, ma'am. Magazine, perhaps? No, ma'am. Okay, your call light is right here. If you should need anything at all, please don't hesitate to call. Thank you. I'm going to go wash my hands and document. And I'll document my findings. Review the steps of my skill and tell the evaluator my skill is done. Okay, so this, um, this video just shows counting with one evaluator. Okay getting ready to redo the videos. I was supposed to do them in December and I didn't get to it. Um, but this just shows one evaluator. The new videos will show it with two, but the process is pretty much the same. Please remember to wash your hands after documenting as well, because that's a new standard that we have to meet. Any questions on Pulse? This is one you can practice on any live human at home. And they don't even need to know that you're doing it. Just reach over and hold their hand while you're watching TV and count their Pulse. Um, but it's something that you can practice pretty easily. Uh, you can also practice on yourself as well because you happen to have a pulse, okay? But get used to feeling the thumps, finding the pulse, feeling the thumps under your finger and get used to counting because like I said, sometimes your brains can go wander, especially when you get up in those higher numbers. Is there any way, okay, so everyone's different, everyone, whatever, so like... Is there a wrong answer during the test? Like, what if, you know, you get a little bit different than the value? So normal, okay, so normal is between 60 and 100, right? So that's normal. For the test, you can be off by four beats in either direction and still be considered accurate, okay, within the, the same, um, no, you don't have to get exactly the same number as the evaluator. But, okay, so, so you need to know those two things. 60 to 100 is normal. You don't have to get the exact same number as the evaluator. You can be four off in either direction. But even if you're way off, okay, the evaluator got 86 and you got 62. It's way more than four, right? You're way off. As long as you do the skill perfectly, you do your opening, you know, you wash your hands, you count the radial pulse at the wrist for one full minute, you do your closing, you wash your hands, you document, you wash your hands, you'll still pass. You'll get a deficiency that your number wasn't accurate, but you're still going to pass. Okay? Because technique counts more than accuracy when you're testing. They know that if you're using the right technique, you're new. New people, that you're never going to be perfect at anything. You're new. This is the one time in your life you can actually get away with being, you know, new right? They know you're not going to be perfect. You're not, the test is not about showing that you are a stellar CNA. It's called entry-level testing. The bar is way down here, okay? You just have to prove that you know the technique. If you're using the right technique, accuracy is going to come with practice. But if you're using the wrong technique, no amount of practice is going to help you because you're always doing it wrong. And then even for like the one minute, like what have you accidentally stopped? The one minute. You want to be as close to that one minute as you can. A couple seconds here or there is fine, but if you're only counting for 20 seconds, that's a problem because the care plan said full one full minute. So if you stop at 58 seconds, that, that's fine. That's fine. Um, the evaluators may, you know, think that you started at a day. That's why you have to say start and stop out loud, by the way, mm -hmm. but it, that's okay. All right, you want to be as close to that full minute as possible. Remember that for the test, it's not about you. Who's it about? The patient. The patient. The patient. It's always about the patient. the patient. So if you can get that into your mindset, because right now you're focusing on you, and that's perfectly normal. You're in class. The test is coming. You're scared to death, and that's totally normal. But that's not what the test is about. The test has nothing to do with you at all, at all. The test has everything to do with that patient. So they're looking at, okay, the care plan said to count for one full minute. You only counted for 20 seconds. Are you going to get an accurate reading? No. And who is that going to affect? That's what they're looking at. Okay, not 
did you follow this to the let that, that that that's not what this is about every step you take has an impact on and that's what they're looking at what is that impact okay good um for the documentation I, um when i'm reading this it says first measurement and second measurement is the first one for you and the second for the evaluator no because you're going to count with each evaluator so you're the first measurement is when you count of the first evaluator second measurement is second evaluator yep so when you say start and make you start your process if you lose it you can stop and start over. You can just mm -hmm. say, you know, I've lost it. I'm stopping. Yep. And then but again, the test isn't about you. Who's it about? The patient. The patient. So who should you be telling? The patient. the patient. Yeah, don't tell the evaluator. They don't count. They don't count. If I lose the count during the test, I'm telling the patient, oh, I'm sorry. My mind wandered. I'm going to start again. Right. So then they'll obviously know that they're not starting Yep. Too. Okay. Oh, yeah. The, the evaluators are smart cookies. They'll keep up. No problem. But talk to the patient. And again, remember I said on the very first class that above everything, it's always about the patient. The patient. If you can remember that, you're going to ace the test because you're focusing all your communication where it's supposed to go with the patient. If you're focused on that evaluator and you're watching them and you're communicating with them, you're not paying attention to the patient. Your focus is in the wrong place. And that's what's going to mess you up. Okay, good. I know it's hard to really kind of wrap your head around that. And I've got three more weeks to get that through to you. And it, you, you don't have it all yet. And that's okay, because I'm not done with you. <laughs> okay, but we're going to talk about this quite a bit through the program, because I really want for the test you to focus on the right place. And if you do that, you will pass the test. You will. There, there's no way you can't. Because I'm teaching you everything, all these principles, and every single one of them always go back to the patient. The, patient. the opening, everything on the opening is all about the patient. the patient. The closing, everything on the closing is all about the evaluating gloves. That's all about the patient. Starting to see it? Yeah. Okay. So there's no way that you can fail the test if you're following the care plan and focusing on the patient and following the principles that I'm teaching you. You just can't, you can't. Oh, um, is there always an evaluator or just for the test? Yeah. For the test, but, oh, let me talk to you about this real quick. I know we're running low on time. I've got so much to say, that's the problem. <laughs> okay, but that's a very valid point and I wanna bring this up real quick. How many of you guys are dreading the test because somebody's watching you? Yeah, absolutely. That's normal. That is absolutely normal. Nobody likes to be watched, right? You're being judged. You're being graded. It's a scary thing, right? Your license is hanging in the balance. It's a horrible thing. Guys, there's no other way to say this, okay? The test is your dress rehearsal for real life because when you are a CNA, you are going to be watched. Not by an evaluator who is watching you. All of them. The nurse is watching you because you are operating under their license and everything you do has an impact on them. The patient is watching you because, yeah, absolutely. And the patient's family is watching you because that's their family. Absolutely. So don't think that this ends at the test. You are going to get watched everything you do. And if you're not, you should be. Because when you're not watched, that's when things happen. Right? So you're going to be watched every patient you care for from now until the end of your career. So the test, yes, you have an evaluator during the test that's watching you and grading you. But that's only the first watch. Right. The ones that really count are the ones that come after. Because that's where it really matters. Good. Make sense. If you kind of get that in your mind, if you rearrange your thinking a little bit, that evaluator becomes a little less scary. Okay. I always look at the evaluators like they are the family member of that patient. 
what do I want that family member to see? Yeah, that you care, that you aren't going to put their, pay, their family member in jeopardy, that you are going the extra mile, that you're treating them like a human and not a lump of flesh, right? So if you kind of look at that evaluator, like they're a family member of that patient, you will provide the best care to that patient that you can. And that's what's going to get you to pass the test. But don't stop at the test, please. All right. Good. All right, here we go. Moving on. Go to page 102. Oh, thank you, Win Win. You are such a wonderful, organized, and informed teacher. Thank you. Oh, that's so sweet. I love what I do. I really am very fortunate that I get to do this every day. I really am. And I, I'm very thankful. Very thankful that I get to do this. All right, so page 102, we are going to learn dressing a resident with a weak arm. So if we're looking at this, oh, this is scary. Look at all those principles. Scary. We have a lot of principles that are going to affect this particular skill. We have our skill specific. There is a video we'll be watching. These are all the details of all those principles. And then down here is our test specific information. We can see that we need to perform this skill in 14 minutes or less. It's gonna be a mannequin. We're still gonna to talk to the mannequin, just like she's a real person. Mannequin's gonna be in bed. No charting is required for this one. But let's take a look at these principles a little closer. Of course, we know skill rules, we know opening, we learned glove rules today, and we know the closing. So we have three that we need to learn in order to do this skill, along with the test specific, which we'll get to in a minute. But let's focus on these three, okay? So right now, as of right now, we know four of the principles on the back wall. We're gonna add three more to it. So by the time you leave here today, you are going to know seven out of the 11. We're also going to go over half of linen rolls. So you're going to know really seven and a half. Okay, good. Questions? Ready to get started? All right. Okay, so the first one we're going to go over is barrier. This is on 84. And if you look here, you can see that we're gonna use a barrier for a lot of the skills that we do. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 of the 20 skills are gonna require a barrier. So this is one of those things that we have to learn because we're gonna use it over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. And there is a video for it. Oh, we're not gonna watch the video, I'm gonna talk to you instead. Mm -hmm. So our specifics are going to start on page 85. These are the notes for the lecture I'm about to give you. Okay. Remember I said you don't have to take notes. I've done it for you. But you probably are going to want to answer those questions at some point after class so that you can make sure that you really true, truly get this concept. All right. So let's talk about these tables. These tables are used for meals. They're called overbed tables. This is where your patient is gonna have their meals in most cases, but they're also used for a ton of other things. Crossword puzzle books, chapstick, cell phones, used tissues, urinals. I mean, all kinds of stuff goes on this table. Can we consider this overbed table clean? No. 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 It's actually probably one of the dirtiest things in the room. Yeah. Now, if I have done my opening, knock, knock, knock. Hi, Miss Jones. My name is Patty. I'm your CNA today. I'm here to get you dressed. Is that okay? Close curtain, wash hands. Now I got to get my clean supplies. I need a place to put those supplies. Makes sense, right? Is this table clean? No. So I can't just set those clean supplies on this table because the table is not clean. Good? Mm -hmm. But the supplies are. Okay? So if the table isn't clean, 
and my supplies are, that means that we need to create a clean surface. And that's why we're going to use a barrier. Now, barriers can be a lot of different colors. They can be tan or green or blue or whatever. Um, but the big thing about a barrier is that it has two sides to it. It has an absorbent side and it has a waterproof side. Now, this thing is actually called a disposable underpad. That's its name. It's called a disposable underpad. That's a whole lot of syllables. That's a lot to say. Disposable underpad. And to complicate issues, there are different types of underpads that are used in clinical settings. <clears throat> like this. This is a washable underpad. Okay, so we have a washable under pad and we have a disposable under pad. Now, the one thing that you're going to find out in medicine is everything always has two names. Everything has two names. I don't know why. Can't help you there, but everything has two names. So if keep your finger there, but go to. Where is it? Where are my supplies? What is it? Is it nine? I have a, hold on. I should have this in front of me. I don't know why I don't. Where are my supplies? 37. Okay, so 37 has pictures of all the supplies that we're going to be using. And it shows you the names of all of those supplies. And you see most of them have two names, right? I don't know why that is, but it is. So we have washable under pads, which we call bed pads. Somebody's call, asking for a bed pad. This is what they're looking for. Disposable under pads, we actually call them chucks because they're the kind that you chuck it when you're done. Okay, so these are called chucks. These are called bed pads. They're both under pads. Some places may, but usually there's a distinction between the two. Yeah, usually. I'm not saying that some people won't call them chucks. They may, but these are usually called chucks because you chuck it when you're done. So this is put on the overbed table with the absorbent side facing up when we're going to be creating a clean surface. That way, if anything liquid gets on it, it's going to absorb it, keep it from dripping onto the floor, and the waterproof side keeps it from going onto the table. Good? Questions? All right. So we have clean supplies. We're going to wash our hands before we get those clean supplies. So we need a clean place to put those clean supplies that we're handling with our clean hands. Got it? A lot of clean going on there. And that's what the barrier is all about. It provides a clean place for your clean supplies. And we only touch supplies with our clean hands. So what do you think barrier is about? Clean. Sure. Absolutely. Now, I have a lot of people tell me, well, we never use barriers where we work. And that's fine if that's your policy. But I'm betting that if you went and looked up the policy and procedure in that manual that no one ever looks at, they probably want you to create a clean area. Okay. Just because it's the way it's done doesn't mean it's the way it's supposed to be done. Anybody ever experienced that? Yeah. Okay. So when we're talking about clean, the one thing that we have to understand is not clean is our uniform. Once we start work, your uniform is not clean. It's leaned up against the bed. It's brushed up against the curtain. It's leaned against the sink. It's knelt on the floor to do foot care. Your uniform is not clean. 
So if I've done my opening, washed my hands and got my supplies, I don't want to hold those clean supplies right up against my uniform, uniform because my uniform is not clean. clean. Good? Okay. All right. So clean supplies should not touch your uniform. But the problem is this. Let's say, let me move this over real quick. Let's say that I'm taking care of this patient and I'm going to dress her and I've done my opening. Knock, knock, knock. Hi, Ms. Jones. My name is Patty. I'm your CNA today. I'm here to get you dressed. Is that okay? Yes. Close curtain. Go wash my hands. And now I'm getting my supplies. Now I know I need a barrier because my barrier rule says I do. And I got their clothes. We'll pretend these are clothes. Okay. So I've got my barrier and I've got my clothes and I come over here. Let me hold this up real quick. I come over here to my table, which is where my barrier needs to go. I've got a barrier and I've got my clothes and I've got the table. Oops. Now, in order to get this spread out on the table, I really need two hands. So what you end up doing is this. What can't the clean supplies touch? Uniform. Your uniform. So if you get your supplies at the same time you get your barrier, you're going to end up contaminating your supplies. See how that would be a problem? So this is a two-step process. Now, everybody wants to shortcut this. Don't shortcut this. It's a two-step process. Wash your hands. Go get the barrier, just the barrier. Bring it over to the table. Unfold it, spread it out, and then go get the rest of the supplies that you need. That way you're not holding stuff right up next to your clothing. That is a testing principle, guys. If you end up holding that stuff against your clothing, it is a deficiency. If there's stuff on our table, are you able to that where we put that stuff? For the test, the tables will be empty. No, I'm talking about like in real life. In real life, you're going to have to carve out a space. Okay. Yeah, it's horrible. It's horrible because that's that's the only space your patient has to put their stuff, mm -hmm. right? So there's always stuff on the table. Just kind of move it, carve out a space, and put your barrier there. Yeah. Um, it is what it is. But for the test, tables are miraculously empty. Great. It's the only time in life you'll ever see empty tables. <laughs> so... Remember, it takes two hands to unfold and spread, and you can't let those supplies touch your uniform. So we're going to go get the barrier first, put it on the table, then go get the rest of our supplies, and that keeps our supplies clean. Questions on barrier? Easy peasy? Okay, one more principle down. That wasn't hard. Okay, so now we have five under our belt. So we're going to get the barrier first, spread it on the table, and get the rest of our supplies. Now let's move on to privacy blanket. So dignity, of course, is essential. We all know that, right? But so is comfort. Now I'm going to, again, challenge the way you think about some things as we go through this principle. So just like gloves, I had to get you to unlearn a few things. We're going to do the same thing with privacy blanket, okay? Now, we just went through this in here today. I want the door open. Why do I want the door open? Okay. So why do I think it's hot and stuffy in here, but you guys don't? All right, so I'm upright, standing up. I'm moving around. I'm doing a lot of talking. I'm active, right? You guys are sitting down. You're not doing a whole lot. So what do you think the temperature is going to feel like to me in here? What do you think it's going to feel like to you? Okay. Now, you guys are all fully clothed, though. Even though you're sitting and you're, you know, you're still fully clothed. What do you think the temperature feels like in here to them? Way colder. So there's a big difference in the way that me and the patient is going to um, interpret the temperature where we're at. Does that make sense? OK. 
Okay. So this is something that you absolutely need to understand because it's always about the patient. But when we're working, we tend to focus on us. So we have to remember that the way I feel about temperature is going to be different from the way the patient feels about temperature. So closing the curtain, we're going to talk about temperature again in just a minute, but closing the curtain doesn't really do anything for temperature, does it? No. And it helps block the patient from all of the people out there, right? Other patients, people walking down the hallway, you know, other staff members, but it doesn't do anything to protect that patient from the stranger in the space with them. Who is that? Us. We are a stranger and we're about to see all of their dangly bits, right? Do you think they're comfortable with that? You're still a stranger. Now, a lot of CNAs will take the position that, oh, seen one, seen them all. I've seen so many. I don't pay attention anymore. I don't really care. Do you think that matters to them? No, no their dangly bits are very important to them. They don't care how many I've seen. They don't want me to see theirs, right? Got it? Remember to put yourself in the patient's position when you're thinking about these things. So having the privacy curtain does a good job protecting them from all of those people, but it doesn't do anything to protect them from you. That's why we're going to use a privacy blanket. Anytime the patient is uncovered or undressed, we're going to provide an additional level of privacy in the form of a privacy blanket. Good? uncovered or undressed. Now, this privacy blanket does two things. The first is that it's going to keep them warm. And the second is that it's going to provide privacy from you. Okay. Now, this is something you need to know. It's not going to be on the care plan. No care plan is going to say use a privacy blanket. This is something you need to know, just like you need to know when to wear gloves, when to use a barrier. This is something you need to know, not on the care plan. This is something called a basic nursing principle. Basic nursing principles won't be indicated on the care plan. So by using a privacy blanket, it makes sure the patient is always covered by something. Normally, it would be a sheet, blanket, whatever they've got on them. But if we're taking that away, we got to give them something in exchange. Now, Oops, let's go back here real quick. Um, when we are putting a privacy blanket on a patient, we're not going to snap it or shake it like we do at home. Like at home, I, I just changed my sheets last night. Okay. And at home, I took that sheet and unfolded it and I went to get it all spread out on the bed. How many guys do that? When you do that, I don't know if you can see it here, but see all the, see all those little things that are up there now, those little particles. Yeah, those are actually skin cells, yeast, bacteria, stuff that has fallen off the patient, and you're bringing it right here, where you can breathe it in. Now at home, and I do that. I'm just breathing in my own. Right? It's not that big of a deal. But in a clinical setting, I'm breathing in some stranger's funk, and I really don't like that. So we don't want to aerosolize all of those things that have come off the patient. So we're not going to snap or shake. We're simply going to unfold and spread. Good? Questions? Now, after we're done using the privacy blanket, we have to be careful when we take it away. And this is really going to trip you guys up. This is probably one of the hardest things to learn. And I'm not kidding. This is, this is really, really tough for you. Because at the end of the skill, when you're done with the skill, you're going to want to take that blanket away. Um, this doesn't really apply to dressing, but it applies to other skills where we need gloves. We'll talk about gloves in a minute. But um, you don't want to touch that sheet with soiled gloves. We have to wait until we take gloves off to take the privacy blanket off. So that means the privacy blanket still clean, basically? 
Well, it may or may not be clean, but we're going to wash our hands right afterwards. So it doesn't really matter because remember, pathogens can't get through your skin, right? So it doesn't really matter too much. What matters here is that those gloves are icky, right? Gloves are icky. And if you touch the sheet with icky gloves, those cooties are going to be right up next to the patient's face. All of those wet holes. Absolutely. Absolutely. So does that make sense? You guys got it? So when we use a privacy blanket, we're going to remove it at the end of the skill after we take our gloves off if we use them. Because we don't want to touch that sheet with soiled gloves. Got it? I know this is tough. And we'll talk about it a lot more as we go through. This is not the last time you'll hear this. All right, any questions on privacy blanket? All right, moving on. We're gonna talk about linen rules, okay? And again, this is on page 86. You can see all of the skills that this applies to. We have a lot of skills that we're gonna use linen rules on. But the good news is that we already know some of these rules. There's some repeats in here, like, oh, notes on 87, sorry. Again, you don't have to take notes. But there's some repeats in here, like, linens can't touch your uniform. Oh, we've heard that. So let me stop here, time out for just a second, because I need to point something out. If a principle shows up, or a, a, a bullet point shows up on more than one principle, that means that it is super important and weighs heavy on the state exam. Got it? This seems like a uh, not a big deal. This seems like just a little thing, right? But on the state exam, this counts big. Big. They're watching for this. So don't let anything touch your uniform, whether it's clean or dirty. Good? Next one, we also know Right? You have to have clean hands to get your linens. Well, that makes sense. We're going to be using them on the patient. We have to wait until after we wash our hands to get our linens. So again, super important. One of the biggest uh, mistakes that are made on the CNA exam is that people get the care plan, they go in, and they get their supplies before they do their opening. Okay, that is a big mistake that's made on the CNA exam. And a lot of people make it. You're going to see that during the test. A lot of people make that mistake. Why would that be wrong? Okay, patient has, so they haven't given us consent. It's very presumptuous of us, right? Why else would that be a problem? We haven't, what haven't we, haven't we done? We haven't washed our hands. So we're touching our linens without... Being clean, yeah. You guys see how that could affect your test? You'll see that on the test. People will do that. Because remember, you're going to be paired up with a stranger. You'll see this. Now, if, if let's say that like you're in the you're in the skills lab, like you're the patient, and then you notice that your your per, the person is starting to do his can you say something to him or no? no? Okay. Don't make eyes at them. Don't try to give them any hints. Don't, because that's cheating and both gotcha. of you will be disqualified. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Oh, question. Oh, yeah. Do we open the curtain with the gloves on or do we take the gloves off? No, you don't want to touch that. We don't want to make that curtain any dirtier. Okay. So we want to be careful with what our dirty gloves touch. So after we get done with the skill, we take the gloves off right away. Right. Right, and then we're going to do our closing, and then we'll wash our hands at the end. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Somebody over here have a question? Yeah. I was going to say, um, oh my God. Oh, that's okay. You. That's fine. All right, so we know the first two. Linens must not touch uniform, and we must have clean hands to get our linens. We also know, drum roll, the third one. Don't shake or snap the linens. Okay, same thing as the blanket, because anytime you shake or snap, you're pulling up 
pathogens into your breathing area. Remember I said that pathogens either have to flow or float. When you snap, you're bringing those pathogens into your air space. Oh, I realized after you said certain words, um, yeah, you don't want to gather everything in the beginning because then you're going to start putting it against your clothes and that's something they don't want you to do. Right, right. So the reason that, let, let me back up because I forgot to tell you this. The reason that people do that for the test is because your supplies aren't going to be on the care plan right? The, the care plan isn't going to tell you what you need. Nobody's going to tell you what you need to memorize your supplies. So that can get on dressing. That's easy, right? You need a privacy blanket because patients uncovered and undressed. You need some clothes. That, that's an easy one. But when we start getting into the bigger skills, the supply list gets way bigger. Okay. Makes sense. So a lot of people get really scared they're going to forget their supplies. So that's the first thing that they do is go in and get their supplies because they don't want to forget anything, not understanding that they're actually failing the skill, not because they forgot supplies, but because they touch the supplies with unclean hands, held them against their uniform, don't have a place to put them, didn't get consent, all of those things. So you need to learn your supplies. They're on every skill. Okay, they're on every skill at the bottom. They're also on the flashcards. All of those, all of the supplies you need for each skill is in the flashcards as well. So you have a lot of opportunities here to learn them, but understand you do need to memorize them. Because as a nurse, I'm not going to go, what's your name? Jamie. Jamie. I'm not going to say, Jamie, I want you to go give a partial bed bath and you're going to need a basin, soap, lotion, four washcloths, two towels, a patient gown, and a privacy blanket. I'm not going to do that. Yeah, I'm going to assume that she, I'm just going to say, Jamie, go give a partial bed bath. I'm going to assume that you're a professional and you know what you need to get that job done. Good? Makes sense? Takes me about four weeks to learn your guys' names and then you're gone. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Oh, thank you, Raz. I appreciate that. <gasps> thank you, Wynn. Oh, wow. That's the first time anybody has ever donated to me. Thank you, guys. Yay. Wow. Over 100,000 subscribers. It's the first donation I've ever gotten. Wow. And it's your birthday. Thank you. Oh, yeah, and it's my birthday. That's awesome. You guys just bought me lunch. <laughs> awesome. It's your birthday. It's my birthday. I try not to advertise it. <laughs> All right. So remember, principles that, uh, that are repeated are doubly important. So we got to pay attention to them. Um, so we're not going to cover these two yet, okay? You can see it's blanked out. We're going to get to that on next Monday. So you will see these in just a, a little while, but I'm not going to cover them right now. We're going to go down to the last one because that's the one that, that applies to this skill. Unused items must be discarded. So what that means is if something is out of our sight, we can't trust that it's actually clean. When you take supplies into a room to use them, if you don't use them, you need to put them in dirty linen anyway. You can't return anything to the clean supply shelf. Once it's taken from clean supply, it's no longer clean to go back in. And you can't leave it in the patient's room. Now, I'll give you a good example. So we have a patient who um, is in the hospital. His wife comes and visits. She's got a cup of coffee. And as she comes in, she spills the coffee on the floor. She looks around, sees some washcloths hanging out in a chair, picks up a washcloth and wipes up the coffee because that's what you do. But we don't have hampers in the room. She doesn't know where to put that washcloth, so she folds it back up and puts it back on the stack. You go in later to give him a bed bath and you are bathing him with a coffee-covered German-crusted washcloth. You can't assume that anything out of your sight is clean. So we use it or we lose it. Good questions. So there's no hamper in the room in a clinical setting, but for the test, there is. Thank you. <laughs> that makes it easy. The test, you know, you've got a hamper right there that you can put your stuff in. Nothing goes on the floor. Don't put dirty linens on the floor. Nothing goes on the floor. Not clean, not dirty, nothing. It goes right in the hamper or it goes on your overbed table. You can use that or with the barrier or you can put it directly in the hamper. Now, this might be a silly question, but uh, 
uh, when the when you're disco disposing the dirty linen, could that possibly touch your uniform or no? You want to try not to. Okay. We're going to learn this too. Um, any, not so much for patient gowns because they're not all that big, yeah. right? But anything that we remove from the bed or from the patient, we're going to wind up in a ball. Gotcha. That way we don't have trailing edges yeah. that contaminate other surfaces. Okay. okay. Good. We're getting there, guys. We're getting there. So we're going to go cover the rest <laughs> of linen rolls in more detail next week. But these are um, the linen rules. Linens must not touch uniform. Must have clean hands to get your linens. Don't shake or snap them. And unused linens must be discarded. All right, so we've got all of those out of the way. Let's get into the actual skill now. So all of those things are going to dictate how we do the skill. Okay. So let's learn the key steps required to pass the test. And that's what you're going to see here. And remember, this is in your book on page 102. So these steps came directly from the testing checklist. That I'm making sure that you're getting everything that you need to pass the test. But I'm also making sure you get everything you need to take good care of the patient because I might be that patient one day. Um, page 98 is going to talk to you about dressing basics. Again, I took your notes for you. But it kind of comes down to everyone has a right to choose their own clothing. You have the right to choose what you're wearing because what you're wearing really is an expression of how you feel, right? So if I wake up in the morning and I feel kind of gloomy, I might dress in sweats and a tee. If I wake up in the morning and I'm feeling kind of fancy, I might put on a dress, some heels, right? How I feel is going to be reflected in how I dress. And patients are no different. They have the right to choose their own clothing. So we're going to ask them, what do you want to wear today? But if they choose something that does not match, like purple plaid pants and a yellow flowered shirt, that does not go together we are allowed to suggest an alternative. And the reason for this, and it's actually a pretty big reason, you are judged by the way your patients look. You're absolutely judged by the way your patients look. So if your patients are in uh, clothes that don't match and they're, you know, they don't line up and their hair is all messy, I don't have good CNAs. You don't care about those patients. So you are allowed to suggest an alternative, but we're always going to honor the patient's wishes. If they say no, or if I ask you, would you like your white shirt with those pants? That would look really nice. And they say, no, I want my yellow flowered shirt. No problem. Let me get that for you. So you can make an, a suggestion, but you're going to honor their wishes. Okay. So just like everything else, we're going to use a barrier. So we're going to put a barrier on the table. And then we're going to go get those clothes. But the clothes have to be gotten, have to, before you undress the patient. Why would that be important? So that you don't leave them sitting there naked. That's right. It's all about patient comfort. You don't want a naked patient. Even though they're covered with a privacy blanket, that is not comfortable for your patient. You want to minimize the time that they are undressed. So we're going to get our clothes before. Good? Okay. So we're going to use uh, three methods of protecting their dignity. We're going to pull the privacy curtain because that's part of our opening. We're going to use a bl privacy blanket because that's one of our principles. And we're going to get our clothing before we undress them. Those are all three different ways that we're going to promote their dignity. Okay. I'll tell you, uh, I'm going to quit telling stories. Um, <laughs> Many years ago when I was working in a nursing home, I had a CNA that undressed, it was a shower day. CNA was taking the patient to the shower room, undressed them in their room, put them in a wheelchair and took them all the way down the hallway, completely naked to the shower room. Oh my God. They were naked in the hallway? Yeah. The CNA put them in the, the shower chair and just pushed them all the way to the hallway, completely oh naked. Gosh. Yeah, I... How humiliating. Absolutely. I almost went to jail that day. Um, I was very upset. That's, that's no way to, that, that you don't do that to people ever, ever. 
where anytime we lift an extremity, we always lift from below with a flat palm. We are not the claw machine at Walmart. We don't reach and grab like this. When you grab like this, your fingertips can dig into them and cause bruising and tissue damage. Don't do that. Always lift from below. That way you're providing support um, and you're not injuring your patient. We're going to remember USA first. USA first means undress strong arm first. This patient has a weak arm. That weak arm can't move a whole lot. So if we undress the strong arm first, then that garment's just going to slide right off the weak arm without any motion necessary. And then we're going to dress that weak arm first. And the new thing just slides right on. And we're going to make the strong arm do the work to get into. So when you have a patient that has a weak arm or a weak shoulder, we tell the patient or the family or, you know, we, we make arrangements to get clothing that buttons or snaps up the front. That way it's not a pullover. So we're going to dress somebody in a button or snap front shirt if they have a weak extremity. So we're going to slide that uh, clothing up the weak arm carefully, trying to prevent any overextension or harm. Don't cause injury. Remember, it's always about the patient and your care is judged based on how your patients look. So make sure that the snaps line up or the buttons line up and they're pants are over their butt and the socks, you know, the seam is along the toes, not sideways. Make them look good. Okay. Um, your linens, which is your used gown and your blanket are going to go into the um, hamper. It doesn't go on the floor. You can put it on the barrier until you're ready. That's fine, but don't put it on the floor. And put the call light in the stronger hand. That makes sense. Um, if the what was I gonna ask? Oh, um, if if it's their personal clothing that you're changing, does it still go in the ham hamper with the uh, linen? Facility policy. Okay. Some places will have their own hampers, and their family comes in and gets their laundry and does it at home. Some places, if they don't have family or if they contract with the facility, it'll go into the facility laundry, but it's labeled gotcha. with their name. Gotcha. Okay. So it really depends on where your patients right. are and okay. how we're handling it. So here is our step-by-step um, -step instructions, our peanut butter and jelly. On page 103, I'm going to show you this video. And we're probably not going to get to the last skill today, but that's okay because we got some time later on in the program to play with. All right. Whoops. Mrs. Jones. My name is Patty. I'm your CNA today. How are you? Good. I'm here to help you get dressed. Is that okay? Okay. I'm going to close your curtain. Let me go wash my hands, get my supplies, and I'll be right back. The first thing that I'll get is a barrier to put on my table to make sure that my supplies remain clean. Mrs. Jones, what would you like to wear today? Your light pink pants and dark pink shirt? Okay. Is this the outfit that you described? Wonderful, I'll get a privacy blanket as well. Okay, Mrs. Jones, I'm going to spread this privacy blanket out over you. This will keep you warm and help protect your privacy as we do this skill. I'm going to carefully unfold the blanket, being careful not to snap or shake it as I lay it out over you. Once the blanket's in place, I'll pull your sheet down to the end of the bed. Okay, Mrs. Jones, I'm going to place your socks on now. 
We'll take one of the socks, scrunch it all the way up to the toe seam, put it over the foot, making sure the toe seam is lined up, lift from below and support at the ankle, and smooth the sock over the heel. Now we'll go to the other side. We'll scrunch this sock up, put it over the foot, making sure the toe seam is lined up, lift from below and support at the ankle, and smooth the sock over the heel, minimizing wrinkles. Now we'll help you put your pants on. We're gonna make sure the tag is in the back. I'm going to insert one of my arms into the legs of the pants and scrunch it up so I have control over all the material. We'll then place it over your foot, lift from below, and smooth it over your heel. We're going to repeat on this side. I'm going to put my hand inside to scrunch up the leg of the pants and then place it over your foot, lifting from below and supporting at the heel while we finish putting on your pants. Okay, Mrs. Jones, now I'm going to lift your pants up over your hips. If I can have you raise up your hips as high as you can on the count of three. One, two, three. I'll make sure that your pants are over your hips and then cover you back up. Okay, Mrs. Jones, I'm going to elevate the head of the bed now. Please tell me when you're comfortable. And if I can assist you to lean forward, I'll untie your gown. Thank you. I'm going to tuck a corner of the blanket behind your back as you sit back. And now I'll remove the gown from this side. We're gonna undress the strong arm first. Since our care plan indicated your right arm is weak, we'll undress your left arm first. I'm going to the other side of the bed now. Okay, Mrs. Jones, I'm going to undress this arm. Being careful to minimize the movement and support the arm at the elbow as I lift it off the bed. We'll remove the soiled gown. We'll go ahead and rest your arm back on the bed. Okay, now I'm going to assist you with your shirt. I'm going to scrunch up the arm of the sleeve and put my hand through backwards, keeping your arm supported on the bed I'm going to lift your hand and hold it as if we're shaking hands. This will keep all your fingers together as we place the sleeve over my hand and then over yours. Once we have the sleeve in place on your arm, we'll extend your arm out. I'll support at the elbow as I bring the sleeve the rest of the way along your arm. If I can have you sit forward, Ms. Jones, let me assist you. Thank you. Make sure that you remain covered Support it the and smooth back, the shirt the along your back. Come on back, Mrs. Jones. Thank you. Okay, Mrs. Jones, I'm going to assist you in putting your other arm in your sleeve. So I'll scrunch it up, put my hand in through backwards. And Ms. Jones, if I could have you reach your arm up and back for me. I'll assist you to put your arm in the sleeve. Okay, Ms. Jones, we'll rest your arm back on the bed now while I straighten your shirt and make sure that it is snapped appropriately. See, I got her completely dressed and didn't expose her. Okay, let me just adjust your clothing to make sure it's neat. Can I have you lean forward for me, please? Thank you. And I'll make sure that this blanket can be removed. Okay, Ms. Jones, I'm just going to gather up your privacy blanket and place it in soiled linen along with your gown. I'll be right back. Okay, Mrs. Jones, I'm just going to adjust your clothing for neatness and appearance and make sure that it's fastened appropriately and that you look good. Very nice. Okay, you have your call light here if you should need anything. Can I get a magazine for you? Okay, I'm just going to throw your barrier away. and open your privacy curtain. Now we'll go wash my hands. 
After washing my hands, I'll think about the steps of my skill, make any corrections, and then tell the evaluator my skill is done. All right. Any questions on dressing a resident with a weak arm? Any questions? Just one. Uh, yeah. What if what if they they're too weak to raise their hips? Do you do that? Do you do you try so to you assist? would go by your care, care plan? plan. Because I can't give you one answer that's going to cover everything. Yeah. It really depends on what's going on with the patient. Gotcha. Okay. So in most cases, you can kind of uh, tilt them and pull the pants up this way, tilt them and pull the pants up right. this way. Okay. Um, it really kind of depends, you okay. know, on what's happening. Yeah. Uh, for the test, we're going to pretend the mannequin can move. Yeah. She just has a weak arm. Okay. Which makes it a little easier. <laughs> All right, so we're going to get to range of motion uh, in a future class. I'm going to make a note. We'll get to that one. It's a super quick uh, skill, not a whole lot to teach you. But I want to remind you that I have a CPR class, VLS class, on Saturday at 9 a.m. You do not have to pre-register. Just come. Um, if you're interested, you will need CPR or VLS to work. You don't need it for the class. You don't need it for the test. You will need it to work. While you're enrolled, you get it for 45. After graduation, it goes up to 55. But I also give you a coupon for 50% off the scrub. So basically, it's free. Um, so I'm going to have it this Saturday at 9 a.m. And week four of class, the Monday of class, I teach Monday afternoon from 2 to 6. So Saturday, this Saturday, or week four Monday, after that, the price would go up to 55. So kind of keep that in mind. Um, but we have that available to you. That's here, right? That's in this room. Okay. Yep. In this room. Uh, That's a four-hour class. Four-hour class. Oh. Yep. It's uh, super easy. It's not a pass-fail class, guys. I keep you until I make sure you get it. Because I might be the body one day. I want to make sure you get it. Okay. All right, so let me give you your review sheets. Uh, oh, Nora, let's see. Oh, I don't have mine. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Sorry, I don't have my mic on. Nora asks, what if the patient is on oxygen or life support? Um, again, you're going to go by uh, your care plan for that patient, but you can dress somebody who is completely comatose. But chances are, if they're on oxygen, or I'm sorry, if they're on life support specifically, that's what I'm going to talk about, life support, we're not dressing them. They're just going to be in a hospital gown. There's no reason to put clothing on somebody on life support. It, it just isn't done, generally. If they're on oxygen, there's no accommodations really that need to be made. Just don't make sure when you're buttoning or snapping, don't have the oxygen tubing inside the clothing. Make sure it's on the outside when you're snapping. Other than that, no accommodations need to be made. I hope that helps. All right, so let me pass out your review sheets. Um, again, it's two pages because I haven't had these printed. I just just made these for you guys. Um, I haven't had them printed yet, so they're not front back. So you have two pages. Okay. So these are your review sheets for this class, and you'll see on page two I have that whole chain of infection thing that we went over in class. Can you pass that whole packet down, please? Um, and that will kind of help you remember. Oh, yeah, awesome. Keep going. <laughs> Good. Um, there we go. That'll help you remember the steps of the chain of infection as well as the principles that we learned in class today. Okay, hold on, guys. You three, hold on. <laughs> All right, you are free to run. Have a great day, guys. You too. Happy birthday. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day. Have a great day. I'll see you guys Saturday, those of you that are coming. Otherwise, the rest of you, I'll see you on Monday. I don't know. Happy birthday, Miss Patty. Not necessarily. It just really depends. I didn't pick one for my Oh, you're welcome. 
Uh, stick around. YouTube world, I'm going to sign off. I'll see you guys on Monday. Have a fantastic weekend. Go do something fun.